Hey everybody, welcome on our channel. In this video we are gonna see, what if Naruto got harem with Tai Lee, Azula and Suki. Part 2. If you are new on the channel, don't forget to subscribe our channel and like the video too. So without wasting any more time. Let's start the story. Azula shot up in the bed she was in panting hard, before shearing hot pain shot up her side. Out of insistent her hand shot to the spot gripping it tightly. Out of pride she refused to scream to the world how badly it hurt. Lay back princess. You're still injured. Yelled a medical attendant rushing over to Azula. Where am I? Asked Azula as she looked around what could only be a field hospital. The nurse smiled. At the headquarters of War Minister Kin. Major Naruto is currently with him, said the attendant. How long have we been here? Asked Azula laying back down. About two weeks, said Naruto walking in with Tylee and Mai behind him. Tylee ran up to Azula and hugged her. Azula winced in pain as Tylee brushed her side. Although she could not fault her friend lover for her concern as she too would have been worried about Tylee. Azula? How are you? Asked Tylee releasing said princess from her grasp. Better, but it could have been worse, said Azula before looking at her bodyguard. What's happening anyways Naruto? After you passed out I made my way back to the train. Lo at Lee healed you a bit more than I was able to. After that we hooked up with the nearest unit. We're currently with the 146th division. We're gearing up for a battle, said Naruto. Azula looked at Naruto. What kind of battle? Asked Azula. The man walked in who appeared to be in his forties wearing the traditional war uniform. We're preparing to take Ba Sing Si my lady, said War Minister Kin. Azula looked at Kin. How? My uncle couldn't do it and he was the most decorated general in Fire Nation history. Even he, the great and feared dragon of the west, couldn't breach the towering walls of Ba Sing Si, said Azula frowning. Kin smirked. Allow me to show you my princess, said Kin stepping out of the tent. Naruto helped Azula up and onto her feet. She winced as she felt a small bit of pain shot though her side. She held in her pain, not wishing to appear weak in front of Naruto of all people. As they walked out of the tent Azula gasped at what she saw. Looking up she saw a massive drill before her. How long is it? Asked Azula in pure awe of such a massive structure. Almost two miles long and half a mile wide, said Naruto. Pure glory made real. Impressive. But how long before it's ready? Asked Azula looking at Kin. Kin looked at a scroll that had all the things needed to keep the building on time. A good three weeks if my calculations are correct Princess Azula, said Kin. Azula looked at the massive weapon breaching tool. Get it done in two. What about reinforcements? Asked Azula. Mai looked at Azula. We have an armory of almost 1000 here. How big do you need this army? Asked Mai. Azula smirked as she turned to one of her childhood friends. As large as possible. Ba Sing Si is the one place we have failed to capture time and time again for the last hundred years. I refuse to fail during my turn to take it, said Azula with her eyes travailing to the drill. Two days later. Azula stood in an open field alone wearing only a black tight shirt and slim red pants. She took her stance and started to go through her bending katas. About halfway though she sped up and starting adding light fire blast to the equation. Hitting the twelve katas she stopped as pain shot up her side. Azula almost hit the ground but was caught by Naruto. Calm yourself Azula. You have time take it easy for right now, said Naruto setting her gently on the ground. Azula looked at Naruto with wide eyes. But father expects this to go off without a hitch. I started Azula only for Naruto to put a finger to her lips. Need your rest. Until your wound is fully healed I shall be watching you as if I was a shadow, said Naruto. Azula frowned. She hated when she was talked down to like a child. I'm fine Naruto. I just need my training. Naruto put his hand to her wound making her hiss in pain, before he took it away showing her blood on his hands. You reopened the wound. You're out of commutation until further notice, said Naruto picking her up bridal style. Azula blushed. Hey put me down. I can walk just fine. Yelled Azula. Naruto shook his head. Nah, said Naruto. Azula crossed her arms in defiance, making a few soldiers snicker at how childish Azula looked at that moment in time. They soon regretted it as Azula threw a fireball at them. Once back in the tent Naruto peeled an apple for Azula and handed it to her after taking care of the wound personally. Azula blushed fire red and gladly took the apple from her bodyguard before she stopped. Naruto. Asked Azula looking at the peeled apple. Yes my princess. Asked Naruto peeling another apple for himself. Azula glanced at him and blushed a bit as he was not fully dressed only in a pair of pants. From the stories you've told me you could have destroyed them with the flick of your wrist or even the blink of an eye, Azula paused. My question is why didn't you? Naruto looked at Azula. It's not that I couldn't have killed them, but more along the lines is that I'm weaker than I remember being, said Naruto taking a bite of his apple. What do you mean? Asked Azula just now realizing that she found herself saying that a lot around her bodyguard. 
2000 years is a long time Azala, and while I know I'm stronger than the Avatar my powers are not what they used to be. As a child of maybe 5 I had a chakra reserve of 2 kages. By the time I was 12 it was almost 10, said Naruto. Azala titled her head. Aside from the ancient history of the Hokage's powers of godhood in battle there was little else. She wasn't too sure how powerful they were before, but Naruto had demolished a city with ease, so he must have had some power. Explain please. I don't know much of this chakra, said Azula curious about the real srouse of her bodyguard's power. Naruto sighed. It's like this. On a power scale of say 100. A civilian is a 0 to 1. An academy student is 2 to 5. A janitor foot soilder is 6 to 15. A chuniner experienced soilders are 16 to 30 give or take. A joniner elite soilder is 31 to 50. And Anbu elite firebenders are compared to the highest rank and just below Kage at 51 to 65. Leaving a Kage at 66 to 100 plus depending on their power. Me I was a Kage times many when I was sealed, said Naruto. Azula nodded in understanding getting this a lot better than what she thought she would what is your level now? Ask Azula. Naruto smirked. I'm still Kage plus, but only at about 200 over the limit still making me stronger than most people even your father who is only a Kage level 84. I'm thinking that it was my power with a combination of seals that kept me alive for this long, said Naruto before grabbing his chin. I really don't think they thought I'd live to ever see the outside of that tower again, said Naruto after thinking for a second. What about me? Asked Azula. Naruto looked at her. You're strong. About Anbu level. 60. I'm still strong enough to bring down an army alone if I need to, said Naruto. Why didn't you? Asked Azula. Naruto looked out the tent at the massive machine. As he thought about it, Azula tried to figure it out herself. Why not use the power he once did to destroy the known world? When the tide of flames is at its peck and the four elements are one you'll get your answer, said Naruto leaving the tent. The next day. Azula lay in her bed bored. Mai and Tai Li had been taken by Kin to help oversee some things, while Naruto was overlooking all the soldiers training to make sure everything was in order. The invasion of Ba Sing Si was close at hand. Hey you can't enter this tent. Yelled the voice of a royal solider. Of course I can, came an arrogant voice that Azula knew only too well. We have orders from Major Naruto to not allow anyone but himself, War Minister Kin, Lady Mai, and Lady Tai Li inside to speak with Princess Azula, said the second royal guard. The bad I'm a general and my orders supersede this Major Naruto's, said came the voice, before the two soldiers were blasted into the room. Following the downed warriors was a tall man who was easily one of the most handsome generals in all of the Fire Nation. He stood at just over six feet tall and was about seven years Azula's senior, black hair that fell to the middle of his back and was pulled into a Fire Nation ponytail, a small goatee that accompany his high cheekbones and black eyes well. He wore the traditional general's clothing. The smirk on his face made Azula want to smack it off with a fire whip. Hello my dear Azula, said the man. What do you want Jin? Asked Azula sitting up more out of irritation than respect. Jin smiled and walked forward and got in Azula's face. I heard my betrothed was hurt so I came all the way from the homeland to see you. Are you not happy to see me love? Said Jin with an infuriating smirk on his face. Azula snorted and gave Jin a hard shove to the face. Please you're only here to try and protect your status of entering your blood into the royal line, said Azula. Jin laughed and looked at Azula. He irritated her so much. He tried to act like her uncle used to. Don't get it wrong Azula loved her uncle, almost like he was the kind father in her life, but Jin was far from kind. He was incredible cruel, even by Azula's standards. He had once killed a child for earthbending. A child and he did it in front of Azula. He did something no one not even her own father would do. Please Azula try and be reasonable. After all, said Jin before he grabbed Azula by her arms and pinned her to the floor. I will be your husband come your 17th birthday, said Jin giving Azula a kiss. Azula felt disgusted by his actions and tried to fight him off, but he was too strong and he had her hands pinned, a tear escaped Azula's eyes. Naruto. Help me. Please. Thought Azula in desperation. Dot. A mere few seconds later Jin was grabbed from behind and thrown away from Azula. Azula looked up but found someone blocking her view. Are you alright Azula? Asked Naruto kneeling down to look into her eyes. Azula nodded becoming lost in his eyes. Eyes almost as blue as that water girl's eyes. The worry inside the cerulean orbs melted her heart and ignited passion inside of her body that she didn't know existed. What is the meaning of this? Yelled Jin fire shooting up behind him making soldiers move to back away from him. Naruto turned to Jin and walked out of the tent. I was passing by when I noticed the guards I posted here to protect Azula were gone. They had strict orders not to leave this post unless relieved by either myself or another set of guards. I come in to see if anything happened while I was away. And what do I find? 
I come to find out that you are molesting Princess Azula. How was I to take it, Jin? Said Naruto oh so calmly that Azula felt a shiver of fear run up her spine. Jin snorted. So I was having a moment with my future wife, said Jin getting into his stance. Naruto snorted. If that was a moment then I'd hate to see what happens when you get pissed off you worm, said Naruto looking at his fingernails, as if he had not just insulted a general of high standing within the Fire Nation. Jin growled in annoyance and sent a stream of fire at Naruto. A stream of gold fire. Naruto looked at the fire in surprise before knocking it away with a backhand. Naruto raised his hand and looked at it. It was not burned, but it stung. Almost like Azula's flames did. So that's it. You're a fire-bending prodigy, said Naruto no chakra awe in his voice. One of the soldiers who was posted stood and looked at Naruto. Yes Lord Naruto. He is. Jin the Gold Viper. Considered to be a cruel man, even by Fire Nation standards, said the guard. I see, said Naruto still in his cold tone of voice. Naruto looked at Jin as if assessing his skill level, before looking at the sun. It was nearing nightfall and therefore the end of the working day. Naruto held up his hand and threw out a black fireball that was outlined in red. The flames went into the air before exploding in a white ball of fury. Jin I challenge you to an Anaikai. Said Naruto as fire rained down on him. The Jin it made Naruto look like an eye come back in human form, but to Azula it was something more. Something within the princess of the Fire Nation wanted to have Naruto, and not just as her bodyguard. No she wanted him to be hers. The camp that was already silent awaiting the next move became deaf at what Naruto just said. Jin was known as the Gold Viper for his many wins and sported an honored Anaikai. He had actually ascended to general for defeating his own brother and nearly killing him. Jin smirked despite his fear. I accept you challenge major, said Jin getting into his stance. Naruto held up his hand. Not here. Noon tomorrow. When our strength will be at its peck, said Naruto turning his back to Jin, before pausing and sending out a hard kick unsealing a powerful fire blast. Jin brought up his arms to block, but was sent flying into the dirt. And come with the intent to kill me. Otherwise I'll leave your corpse for the raptor vultures to pick at, said Naruto glaring at the downed general before turning on his heel and walking away. Dot. In Naruto's tent. Mai sat in Naruto's tent as he sat at his small desk still preparing orders and such. This had been going on for about 20 or so minutes, and Mai was getting worried for her friend lover, as he didn't seem to be doing anything to prepare for his upcoming duel with Jin. Aren't you worried? Asked Mai getting off of Naruto bed and crossing her arms as she walked over to him. Dot. Naruto turned to her. Of course I'm worried. Good tea is becoming scare in the camp, some of the previsions are low, and someone stole some cabbages a while ago, said Naruto returning to the papers. Mai frowned and swatted Naruto on the head. Not about that stuff, about Jin. He's a nasty fighter from all the rumors I've heard and isn't afraid to kill his opponent in an honor duel, said Mai. Naruto looked at Mai all joking aside. Of him? Not in the least bit. He's strong I'll give him that, but not very skilled in terms of advanced training, said Naruto setting down his brush. Besides that after I defeat him Azula will be at peace. Mai raised a brow. What do you mean Naruto? Azula fears nothing. Yelled Mai. Naruto shook his head. Apart from her father you'd be right, but this guy has her father's blessing. I read his file. Kin got it for me. He's ruthless, strong, and even considered to be the next coming of Iroh the Dragon of the West, said Naruto. Naruto called a solider in before handing him his orders. If that's all then I have nothing to worry about. Back in my time. A long time ago I used to fight guys of his skill level for fun and sport, said Naruto stripping of his robe and laying down. Now if you'll excuse me. I need a good sleep if I'm going to be taking on that prick, said Naruto closing his eyes, but not sleeping. Mai walked out and Tai Lee came up to her friend. Well what did he say? Asked the bubbly girl. Naruto smirked at the words that Mai said next. He was polite as usual, but I got a feeling that Jin is going to be hurting in ways that can only be imagined. Next day. The field had been turned into a makeshift in Ikiring, with soldiers lined up on either side looking on at what promised to be a masterful match. Naruto was in his tent preparing for the battle with Mai holding his shoulder cowl. He pulled on his armbands and stood. Are you ready to accompany me Mai? Asked Naruto. Mai nodded and followed behind her lover. It was always strange to her how they interacted. At times they acted as if lovers, other times as if just friends, or even just two leaders strategizing for a battle, but not here. Here she followed as a supporter of Naruto's. As they made their way through the throng of soldiers Mai saw Azula and Tai Lee wearing robes of fine silk, preparing to look onto the battle with nothing, but static looks Mai however, knew that both were worried for the blonde. Before she realized it Naruto took the cowl and dripped it over his shoulders, before lowering himself onto the ground with a quick thanks. Mai nodded and made her way to her two friends. Well? Asked Azula. 
be completely focused on this battle almost as if he wants to take this seriously, but can't, said Mai. The acrobat raised a brow at her dark find. What do you mean can't? Mai looked down as Jin approved with his second and third. Naruto is planning on fighting him on an even playing ground, said Mai. Down in the field. Naruto heard the pounding of the drums in his head, the same drums that he used to rage war on traitors, such as Tenten, Sakura, and the like. Drums that beat in his head like this always reminded him of his lost love Hinata. He had never had children with his love, and long before he returned to the world, he stayed in the spirit world looking at Hinata from across a vast field. She always smiled at him, but a great divide always kept them apart even during the red moonlight that allowed them to be together, they only ever exchanged a few words. The drum stopped and took Naruto away from his memories. Naruto rose and turned to face Jin in combat. Jin smirked and charged at Naruto. Naruto opened his mouth and blasted a pure black beam of fire at Jin. Jin ducked under it and fired a fireball at Naruto. Naruto twisted his arm disrupting the attack. Naruto flew forward and raised both his fists in a hammer slam, he hit the ground, unleashing a powerful blast of fire on the ground that charged towards Jin, Jin backpedaled, before using a corkscrew kick to knock the fire to either side. Before standing in his stance. Jin was sweating hard, but Naruto was barely breathing what's with this man. He fights like no mere mortal. Almost as if he is a demon. Thought Jin. Naruto took a step forward and twisted his stance slightly. It was subtle, but Jin knew that whatever the man planned it could very well end. You're very lucky Jin, said Naruto in a cold tone. How am I lucky? Asked Jin knowing that it was a foolish question. Naruto smirked. I haven't tried this yet, but you're a good test subject. This is my answer to the avatar state, said Naruto. But Azula, Mai, and Tai Li. The three girls froze as Naruto's words hit them head on. Did he just say what I think he said? Asked a surprised Mai. Tai Li nodded dumbly at this to shock to even respond like she normally would, but at the same time saw a massive buildup of Naruto's aura that kept shifting colors. If what Naruto said is true then my plans are even closer to fruition than I could ever think possible, thought Azula. Back on the field. Jin shell shocked for a moment started to laugh. Preposterous. Even the fire lords of old could never find a counter to the avatar state. Yelled Jin. Naruto sat on the ground as his body slowly glowed bright gold with a pure black outline, then his eyes flow open before he stood and crouched down, allowing two tails to grow out. Normally I would only use one tail, but to prove to you the vast difference in skill allow me to show you how great the divide is, said Naruto. Naruto vanished from sight, before reappearing and hitting Jin with a flaming uppercut, sending him flying high into the air. Naruto vanished and reappeared high above Jin, before making two flaming black whips. He wrapped one around Jin, before slamming him into the ground, before he came crashing down stomping his feet into Jin's chest. Jin screamed in intense pain as he coughed up blood. Naruto looked down at Jin holding his other whip, before it solicited into a flaming black sword that had only a single edge and resembled a katana. Jin started to shake in fear as he started into nothing but death. Naruto raised the katana and stabbed it right next to Jin's face. Jin panted and looked at the blade before it vanished into black flames. Naruto returned to normal. I could have destroyed you easily in this form, but you provided me with amusement, said Naruto as Jin slowly looked at Naruto. Why spare me? Asked Jin. Naruto turned his back to Jin. Know your place now Jin, said Naruto before continuing in a voice so low only Jin heard him. Azula is mine. I care for her in an unusual way. Same with Tai Li and Mai. Should you ever try what you did earlier with any of them, then your life is forfeit, said Naruto walking away. Jin got to all fours and bowed deeply. Understood master, said Jin now knowing that the Fire Lord was no longer his master, but the man before him was. Naruto walked to Azula who had a royal long sword in her hand that had the Fire Nation insignia as the guard. The fox boy bowed before Azula who smiled at him. Azula held the sword to her face as everyone looked onward as a ring of blue fire encircled herself and Naruto. For many generations each Fire Lord or Lady had a champion, and that champion would go on to become something of a protector of the Fire Nation. Standing before me is my bodyguard and the strongest firebender of the age. I Princess Azula of the Grand Fire Nation, proclaim Naruto Uzumaki my champion, and bestow him my eternal trust and honor. Rise General Naruto Champion of the Fire Nation, said Azula giving her hand a small cut, before putting the Fire Nation symbol on Naruto's head, before sheathing the sword kneeling and kissing Naruto on his forehead. A sign of her trust in him. Azula stood again and offered the blade to Naruto. Naruto took the sword. I accept your trust in me my princess and promise to lead the Fire Nation to victory, said Naruto. The Fire Lord Azai. Azai stood in his chambers flames rising to the ceiling such was his rage visible. Careful years of planning to get Azula to accept Jin as her champion and future husband drew in mere moments. I will not stand for that beast's actions any longer. I will deal with him permanently. 
yelled Ozai snapping his fingers as five warriors appeared before him. You summoned us Fire Lord Ozai? Asked the middle figure. You five are my most deadly warriors in the entire Fire Nation. Those I trust above my own family. Zuko and Iroh are both missing, but while Zuko is a failure, Iroh is a soft-heated traitor, and Azula is straying from the path that will keep us strong, I want you to get rid of the influence over her in Naruto Uzumaki. The figure on the far left flinched at the mere mention of the name Uzumaki. She looked at Ozai as did the others. We shall not fail you Fire Lord. For the last three centuries since your family has ruled the Fire Nation the destruction team has never failed you, said the leader. Naruto-sama, said the girl in a low whisper. Azula sat at the head of the war room with Naruto on her immediate right with Tai Li and Mai off to his right then War Minister Ming, her former betrothed Jin, and a sage from the Fire Temple. She was quite young to be a Fire Sage and was only in her mid-twenties, but her fire bending and devotion to the spirits made it inevitable. She had cut short black hair that stopped just short of her chin, sharp amber eyes, full lips, and a body that had many of the younger Fire Sages, trying to sire an air with her. She stood tall. Only four inches shorter than Naruto, lean body with long legs and small B cup priests. She wore a modified version of the Fire Sage robes that looked more like a Chinese dress, with a large triangulate showing off her bust, black short shorts, and next to her was a Chinese pike that was gold in color. Commanders I'd like to introduce you to Yu Ying. The Fire Sage assigned to us as the one leading the monastic order that has come to aid us. Yu Ying bowed her head. It is a great honor to be in the presence of so many great warriors of our homeland, said Yu Ying. Naruto chuckled as did Tai Li. Raise your head girl. Here no matter the rank if you're in a commander's seat you've earned it, said Naruto. Azula nodded at his words. Yes, but we've had to delay the attack by another two weeks on father's orders, said Azula with a bit of a frown. Yu Ying frowned. My apologies, but your father thought it best to send in a group of 50 monastic acolytes. I am the strongest of the acolytes and have even gained the rank of chief warrior in the order. Jin looked at her. But you're such a young thing, said Jin. My frowned. Tai Li, Azula, and myself are all the youngest in the room with Naruto being the eldest, yet even in his time his age mattered little as by the age of 12, he had already spilled the blood of hundreds, said Mai. Tai Li raised an eyebrow at her friend. A history buff Mai. Asked Tai Li. Before Mai could respond a Solider came in. Lady Azula sorry to interrupt your meeting, but this is important, said the Solider. All the commander rose as one except Azula as two monastic order members dragged in a fairly wounded Earth Kingdom Solider. Where did you find him? Asked Naruto stepping forward to the man. On patrol route 7 sir. If we hadn't found him our invasion would have been in danger, said the acolyte who couldn't have been older than 16. Naruto turned to Azula. How much longer can we afford to wait my princess? Asked Naruto. Azula bit her lip. Three days and not a second more or less, said Azula. 12, noon. Naruto had taken a rhino out to do some scouting alone, being a former ninja had its advantages, but Naruto still liked to ride around on these animals. He stopped his rhino and turned his head. You can come out now. I know you've been following me since I left camp, came Naruto's voice cold and hard. Very good Naruto-sama, came the voice of Yu Ying. Naruto dismounted and looked at her. You called me Sama, but to most people that comes from the throes of a dead archaic language, said Naruto. Yu Ying nodded. That would be true if my family hadn't kept to the old ways. You may know of my ancestor Kakashi and his wife Shizune, said Yu Ying. That froze Naruto. Kakashi had been his protector for most of his childhood years and later teacher and friend, while Shizune had been something of a big sister to him before she had retired to give birth to her first child. A little girl they had named Naruko in honor of Naruto himself. Speak quickly before I take your head, said Naruto. Anger clear in his voice. Yu Ying bowed to Naruto. As you know I am a warrior of the monastic order, but aside from that I am one of Azai's weapons. One of the fingers of his fist, said Yu Ying. Fist? Asked Naruto. Yes. The fist of compass of the five most deadly assassins of the entire Fire Nation. We have only ever been called forth a few times in Azai's rule. I myself have only had six missions under him. We are never truly active at the same time, and we have never meet without our masks on to prevent our identities from coming out. Only the Fire Lord knows who we all are. Naruto sat down and looked at the woman. What is your current mission Yu Ying? Is it so damning that you would risk the Fire Lord's wrath by telling me this information? Asked Naruto. Yu Ying looked at Naruto dead in his eye. The mission of the closed fist is as follows eliminate champion general Naruto Uzumaki. Our secondary mission is to waft Princess Azula for signs that she is falling form her father's control, said Yu Ying. Naruto looked at her. If you had attacked me at the camp I wouldn't have even expected to it, said Naruto. The blood loyalty of my family's honor excited that of my loyalty to the Fire Nation. If you asked me I would kill the Fire Lord in a heartbeat, said Yu Ying looking at the man she would soon call master. 
Naruto looked at her in the eye. Tell me everything, said Naruto. A few hours later. Naruto and Yu Ying stood together in his tent. She had told him as much as she knew, but Naruto was still with his doubts. I don't know. How can I be sure that you won't turn on me like you did the Fire Lord, said Naruto. Yu Ying looked at Naruto. She bit her lip before her hands went to the clips holding her dress on. I have none, but my body, please accept it, said Yu Ying removing her clothes and covering her free slider to hide her embarrassment at showing a man her body. Naruto was tempted. Oh how tempted he was, but he already had Mai and if his luck held out Tylee and Azula soon. Put your clothes back on Yu Ying. As much fun as it would be to take you I have something I need you to do, said Naruto. Yu Ying slid on her shots and put her dress back on. What is that? Asked Yu Ying clipping the dress together. Naruto put on a smile, and Yu Ying knew that what he had in store was going to be dangerous. Serpents pass. Batara woke with the sun and looked around the camp. Everyone had had a good sleep, well almost everyone. She looked over at Toph's tent that was down and looked at the girl who had she could consider a younger sister. Hey Toph what's the matter? Asked Katara. Toph yawned loudly as she looked at Katara. Nothing Snoozles was giving it to his girlfriend for almost four hours last night, and I got to say your father has a really big beep, said a slightly agitated Toph. Katara blushed. Not something I wanted to know. And why are you agitated? Asked Katara. Toph looked down. Because all he sees is a little blind girl who needs protection, said Toph gripping a rock and crushing it. I don't need protection. I'm just as capable as anyone else even more than him, said Toph. Batara sighed as she saw that there was more to the story, but was going to ignore the Jalousy issues for now. It's not that he sees you as weak Toph, said Katara taking a set next to the girl. Sokka has always has always felt the need to protect people. He was the eldest boy in the village was made acting chief by father at just the age of 11, said Katara. Toph's eyes widened slightly. Really? Asked Toph. Katara nodded. Really and to add pressure to this he had to feed the entire village as well as protect it. The village has over 200 people most women, children, and elders, said Katara. Toph looked back over at Sokka and saw him in a whole different light. I never knew, said Toph. Katara shook her head and turned to leave, deciding to keep the fact that a lot of women throw themselves at Sokka for extra food and such things to herself. But Team Azula. Azula smiled as the drill made its way to Ba Sing Si, accompanied by a small army of fire tanks. Finally I will succeed where my uncle failed, said Azula sitting on her throne with a smile. Beckerful Azula fate has a way of turning things on you, said Naruto sitting in a chair apple and knife in hand. Azula raised an eyebrow at this, though in Sarusti not anger. Explain please, said Azula. Haile grinned. She always had a love of stories. Mai shrugged and took a set next to Naruto with her head on his lap. Naruto nodded. A few years before my birth Uzumaki or the country of swirling tides was one of the biggest military powers in the elemental nations. They too were confident in their power. At least until Cloud, Mist, and Rock banded together to attack, and even though 4-5 THS of the invading army was wiped out after nearly two months of fighting whirlpools still fall, and my mother was the only survivor, said Naruto taking a silic of his apple. Tylee looked down in sadness at this. What a tragedy, said Tylee. Mai nodded. Yeah makes my outlook on life look a little darker. If such a thing could happen, said Mai. Azula narrowed her eyes. What's your point? Asked Azula. Naruto stood up and looked at the wall. No point, just don't let power go to your head. It could lead to your fall, said Naruto. Twenty minutes later. Azula frowned as the earthbenders appeared and started to attack her drill. It was really pissing her off. Naruto, Tai Li, Mai, be dears and deal with them, said Azula. Naruto smirked. All right, but let's leave them alive ladies, said Naruto as they opened a hatch and jumped into the middle of the field, where Naruto did unleashing a breath of fire. The earthbenders only took a second to notice before they brought up a large dome of earth over them. Hold the line men. Yelled the commander as he and his men got into their attack formation. Naruto landed next to him with a smirk. You won't hold a damn thing. And for the record I could defeat you without my bending, but my friend was bored, said Naruto. After Naruto said this Tai Li floated from behind Naruto and into the large earth benders. As she moved she disabled them with jabs and kicks. Naruto smirked as she disabled the last one. Naruto walked up to the commander and pulled out a note. This is a sign of surrender. I'll halt the attack for two hour. If you don't have that signed I will personally bring down the wall, said Naruto putting the letter into the commander's belt before grabbing Tai Li and retuning to the tank. The commander looked at the man and realized that he didn't have so much as a speck of dust on him from hitting the ground. But Team Azula. Azula glared at her champion with a fire in her eyes. Let me get this straight you gave them two hours to surrender to us without consulting me. Hissed Azula from her throne as Naruto stood before her. Naruto didn't even bother to come up with some excuse. 
If they surrender we lose no men or anything, and they have already seen what an elite agent can do on her own, as well as the champion of the Fire Nation. What chance do they have against two full battalions? Asked Naruto. Asla glared at Naruto who saw her hand light up. Naruto Barley moved as the blue flame whip hit him across the face. Fool. The full might of the Earth Kingdom lays behind those walls. Giving them two hours to prepare a countermeasure is not something I wish to do. See Dazzler. Naruto walked up to the throne and put a hand on her chin, forcing her to look at him. Listen to me Asla. A physical battle is one thing, but a physiological battle is a whole other matter. My old lover Ino was a physiologist and enjoyed toying with the minds of her victims, while my old lover Anko looked to punish the body. Once they worked together they could make anyone talk. Attack the mind first and then the body, said Naruto turning to leave. Asla glared at Naruto. What if I order the attack? Asked Asla. Naruto stopped in his tracks. Then I'm going to make you regret it Asla first with your mind and then your body, said Naruto a cold tone in his voice. Asla nearly flinched at the implications. You wouldn't dare rape me. Yelled Asla standing and her voice shaking slightly. Naruto smirked. Who said anything about raping you? Disobey this and I'll make you wish I had raped you, said Naruto. Of Team Avatar an hour and 55 minutes later. Batara was healing a solider to the best of her abilities, but it was hard because the natural paths in his body were blocked. It's the best I can do. His body is rejecting the healing, said Katara sighing. This is Ty Lee's work. Definitely. The soldier groaned. It was two people that beat us, said the man. A man who used black fire and a girl who hit us and took us down from the inside out, said the man. Sokka grinned. That's it. We'll do what Ty Lee did. We'll take the drill from the inside out, said Sokka. Off nodded. It could work. If they got lucky. All right then. Follow my lead and hold on tight this is going to be a bumpy ride down, said Toph stepping forward and hitting the small part of the earth wall, having it enter into a free fall. Once they hit the ground Toph created a hole in the ground and everyone went in. Crap I can't see a thing, said Sokka. Oh no. The horror. Came a sarcastic Toph. Sokka blushed. Sorry Toph. Toph grinned and you could hear it in her voice. It's cool, I like busting your balls, said Toph feeling the blush on Sokka's face about busting balls. They made their way forward and directly under the drill. Ong leaps up to the bar hanging from the opening and, dangling upside down from his legs, hoists Sokka and Katara into the drill. He realizes Toph isn't following them. Sokka sticks his head out of the drill. Off come on. Yelled Sokka. No way am I going in that metal monster. I can't bend in there. I'll try to slow it down out here. Said Toph. Okay Toph. Good luck, said Sokka. With Naruto. Naruto stood up and slowly walked away from the main room. Asla's eyes cut to her champion. Where are you going? Asked Asla. Naruto frowned. We have some rats on the drill. I'm going to go and greet them, said Naruto. Asla narrowed her eyes. Very well, said Asla. Naruto took off down the corridor at a dead run. With Team Avatar 20 minutes later. Ong and Katara had just finished cutting though the support beam, but it had barely sled inches from its starting point. A dull creaking sound could be heard before Sokka got a large grin on his face. Do you hear that? We took it down. We better get out of here fast. Yelled an excited Sokka. As they make their way to the door they stop hearing an announcement that stopped all their hearts. Congratulations, crew. The drill has made contact with the wall of Ba Sing Si. Start the countdown to victory. Yelled Kin. Sokka grabbed his head in frustration. Oh what the fuck. That should have been game over 1-2-3. Yelled Sokka slapping the back of his right hand into his left palm. This is bad, really bad, said Katara looking more worried than her brother. Ong gritted his teeth before something came to mind. Maybe we don't need to cut all the way through. Toph has been teaching me that you shouldn't give 100% of your energy into any one strike. Sokka, take a fighting stance, asked Ong. Sokka did as asked before Ong got in front of him. You've got to be quick and accurate. Hit a series of points and break your opponent's stance, said Ong before sticking Sokka several times. And when he's reeling back, you deliver the final blow, said Ong hitting Sokka on his head. His own weight becomes his downfall, literally. Sokka fell over before getting to his feet as Katara smiled. So we just need to weaken the braces instead of cutting all the way through, said Katara. Sokka grinned. Let's get to it, said Sokka. For the next 15 minutes they cut though the beams halfway before stopping. Good work, Team Avatar. Now Ong just needs to duck. Yelled Sokka taking Katara to the ground. Ong hit the deck as a stream of black fire sailed over them. Ong stood up and looked to see Naruto standing there. Naruto took a step forward making the gong take a step back. Naruto looked at the gong before they all saw their deaths at his hands. Ong started to shake and felt blood flow from his hands. That vision had made his grip his staff to an almost breaking point. 
Ong looked behind him. Sokka had his blade ready to slit his own throat, and Katara was on her knees crying. I really hate doing that, but it was the most effective way to stop you Avatar, said Naruto his voice as cold as the South Pole waters. Ong shook his head. My name is Ong. The last airbender, said Ong getting into a defensive stance. Naruto snorted. Please kid. You're ready to piss yourself right now. I could kill you, said Naruto before vanishing. Before you'd even have a chase to blink, came Naruto's voice. Ong's eyes widened as he felt a knife in his lower back. Ong did the splits and did an air kick sending Naruto into a beam, nearly breaking it in half. Sokka. Katara snap out of it. Yelled Ong. Both came to, and Sokka dropped his blade. Both breathed hard before they regained enough scene to run. Naruto got out of the beam as Azula, Mai, and Tai Lee presucks Team Avatar. He followed after them with a deep frown on his face. Tai Lee looked at her friend and shivered. His aura was blazing red. A clear sign that he was angry. They saw the three of them split up. Azula smirked. Naruto with me. We're going after the Avatar. Tai Lee, Mai after his peasant friends, said Azula. Naruto nodded and followed after Azula. On top of the drill. Ong was cutting into the drill as fast as he could, but stopped and turned the falling rocks into a shield as two heated streams of fire came at him. Ong looked to see both Naruto and Azula in their stances. Ong gulped at this. One on one he could hold his own against either of them, but two on one he was dead meat. Look here Naruto. We have an ant on my drill how should we deal with him? Asked Azula. Naruto got out of his stance and drew his sword. A lot of pain with a side of broken bones should do the trick, said Naruto charging at Ong. Ong gulped and jumped to avoid the deadly slash that would have taken his head off. Azula laughed a fireball at him with Naruto following it up with a fire whip. Ong bended the wall making a shield that stopped the attacks, but was caught unaware as Naruto appeared next to him. Ong turned slightly as the sword nearly priced his chest, only resulting in a cut to the arm. Ong began to freefall as Azula appeared below him. Time slowed for Ong as two streams of fire came at him. Twisting his hands his fired two wine streams deviating the attack from himself. Naruto rode the fire and landed on the ground as Azula glared at Ong. Naruto looked at Ong. He's stalling Azula, said Naruto. Azula raised a brow. Stalling. Stalling for what? They both looked back as the metal of the drill began to rupture. Naruto cursed. He grabbed Azula and vanished just as Ong delivered the final strike to the drill. A day later. Naruto sat in his tent rage clear on his face and Ming by his side shaking like a leaf. Naruto looked at her and knew that she was feeling his rage, even though it wasn't directed at her. You have nothing to fear Ming. I'm just pissed off at the Avatar and his little gang of friends. Said Naruto. Ming nodded I understand Lord Naruto, said Ming. As Naruto sat there one thing kept going over and over in his mind. How had he not seen it coming? He had used a smiler tactic by stalling his enemies until either he got back up or he could kill their commander. Lord Naruto Lady Yu Ying is here to see you, came a voice of a guard. Send her in, said Naruto. Yu Ying entered the tent and bowed. My lord. I have some news for you, said Yu Ying. What is it? Asked Naruto not really in the mood for such things. Yu Ying smiled. You're going to love this my lord, said Yu reaching into her satchel and pulling out some papers. Naruto scanned the papers before his eyes went wide. He looked at her and quickly understood just how gravely he underestimated Oz Ai and by extension the Fire Nation. Are you sure? This is crazy even for Oz Ai, said Naruto. Yu Ying nodded. I swear on my honor that it is the truth. That is why he is trying to eliminate you and the Avatar. Naruto looked at this intel. Damn him. Said Naruto burning the papers. For now keep this info between us. And Ming if so much as a word gets out you wish you were never born, said Naruto in a cold way. Both women shivered as they knew that he was more than capable of. But Azula. Azula sat near a stream without her armor and her hair down. In her hands was a small flute. She put the flute to her lips and allowed the melody to flow out of her. The song unlike herself at times was like harmony to the world and gave the impression that there was turly peace. It was a tone that could make a person's soul fly though the stars and swim in the oceans. She stopped playing as she felt a presence behind her. Your father always hated that piece Lady Azula. Azula spun around to find what could only be a man dressed in a black robe with red trimmings and custom black Fire Nation armor. What do you want? Asked Azula knowing full well that this was one of her father's personal assassins. The assassin shrugged. Nothing really my princess. I was just on assignment and stopped for a quick chat with you, said the man. Azula frowned. Father would kill you for stopping your assignment to chat even if it was me, said Azula. Maybe. It has been forever my lady. I will see you soon, said the man before vanishing. Azula looked at the spot he just was, and a shiver ran up her spin at his last words. If one of those five made a promise they kept it. But Naruto. Naruto had began to take a walk a little over an hour ago. 
the troops had cleared the camp before the Earth Kingdom soldiers had time to find their base came and launch a counter assault, and that suited Naruto just fine, he often did things like this himself after a failed mission in the Fifth War. Regroup, burn down camp and come up with a better attack. He frowned as he thought over the information that Yu Ying had brought him. The only chose available to him and Azula was to move Azula's plans forward slightly. He stopped walking and turned his head slightly. Can I help you? Asked Naruto as a man the man in the black robe appeared. The man looked at Naruto. You'll have to forgive me champion Naruto, but I have orders from the Fire Lord to end your existence. Naruto sighed. Why is it that bad guys never take height of warnings when presented, said Naruto mostly to himself before turning to his opponent. I'm a rather busy general, and I need to make plans with Azula in 15 minutes, so I'll kill you in 10. The man removed his mask and drew his blade. He was easily in his mid-forties, and his face was scared in a way that reminded Naruto of Ibiki's face. His hair was stained in a SALT and pepper way. Naruto barely glanced at him. Let me guess. An assassin for Oz, I? Asked Naruto. The man nodded. For what it's worth I hold no personal grudge towards you, said the man. Naruto nodded. I know the rules. An assassin is just a weapon to be wielded. I myself was an assassin before I came into a position of great power. Even so as we both know the rules then you know that as this is just business I'm going to have to kill you, said Naruto. The man smirked. Too bad I'm ordered to kill you. You'd make one hell of a partner. Before you die I am Quinn the Silent Walker, said Quinn. Oh and why are you called that? Asked Naruto only for Quinn to vanish before his very eyes. Naruto got into a defensive stance. That won't work, came Quinn's voice as Naruto was stabbed though his chest just inches from his heart. Naruto winced in pain as he turned and threw out a kick when both the sword and the man vanished. Naruto tried feeling for his presence, but felt nothing. Even the hidden Miss Jutsu wasn't perfect as a person could still be felt though their chakra. Eliminate all traces of one's existence. Emotion, breath, mind and body, and it's as if you're fighting something that was never even there, came Quinn's voice from all around the area and inside Naruto's head. Naruto stood with a smirk and closed the wound before closing his eyes. A very useful trick and one very becoming of an assassin in a large crowd, said Naruto as the wound on his chest sizzled shut, leaving no trace of the attack but a hole in his clothes. If I didn't have my advanced healing abilities then I'd be one dead man right now. Quinn appeared again, but this time found Naruto facing him. Quinn was about to vanish again, but Naruto was quick enough to barb him by the face and slam him into the ground. Before drawing back his left fist and slamming it into Quinn's chest or where Quinn was supposed to be. Quinn appeared in a tree and looked at the impact crater where Naruto's fist once was and was impressed by his sheer power. Quinn was actually starting to get excited and a scar over his left eye was pushing in pain. The Dragon of the West had given him that scar back in his younger days as a royal guard. Funny thing about memories. They give a life all their own, and with them brought presence, existence, came Naruto's voice as a hand ripped right thought Quinn's back. Quinn coughed up blood as he smiled. A good fight, but as you know as long as an assassin draws breath. His mission has not failed, said Quinn. With a shaking hand he pulled on his belt, a click was all Naruto heard before an explosion happened, sending him flying backwards he was ringing. Naruto looked up, but his eyes were blinded currently, and the only thing he could see was white. His hearing was also shot as he felt the blood rushing out of his ears. Naruto growled. Damn assassin. I can't hear or see a damn thing, said Naruto getting even more pissed off at the fact that healing would take a bit longer. Well it was true that he could regenerate a lost lamb or even his heart over a period of about two or three weeks. Injuries such as busted eardrums or blinded eyes take at least a good half a day. Naruto closed his eyes. Dust as well I need some sleep anyway. Naruto Uzumaki sat in his office in his family home with a glass of wine in his hand as he finished reading over a report on his desk. The office was lightly furnished and was done in the colors of blue and lavender at the insistence of his wife for the last year and current head of the shinobi council Hinata Hyuga. Excuse me Hokage-sama may I enter, came a voice from the door. Naruto smiled. Please come in Tenten-chan, said Naruto. The door to the office opened and in walked one of the few people Naruto trusted with his life. Tenten was a vision of beauty that had many people asking for her to wed them. Of course they had to get past Naruto and Lee first. The day however her hair was styled in a single offset bun that was to the left side of her head with a long bang hanging down the right side of her face, her brown eyes shone with an air of happiness and life that Naruto know was all her own. She had on a light bit of blush and blood red lipstick, on her body was a pink kimono with orange and white koi fish dancing around on it. What are you doing in your office Hokage-sama? Asked Tenten in a teasing voice. Naruto groaned. Please don't start with that again Tenten. And what do you mean what am I doing? I'm doing my damn job woman. Just got a report from our rep in sand. 
Gara is talking about opening up the old trading routes with stone, but since we control those he was asking if we co started Naruto only for Tenten to put a finger to his lips. Naruto looked at Tenten who had a smile on her face. Naruto forget that. No more work for the day. The summer festival is about to begin. You need to get dressed as the council and elders are expecting you to make a big speech before the end of the festival. So get dressed or I'm going to kick your ass, said Tenten playfully before giving Naruto a kiss on the cheek, before she jumped up and ran to the door. Naruto gave a mock glare. That's treason you know. Yelled Naruto pointing at her. Tenten laughed and stuck her tongue at him. Please you'd never charge your big sister with treason, said Tenten. Naruto smiled at her. Yeah well I'll see you later. I need to get dressed, said Naruto. Tenten nodded, before blowing a kiss to Naruto. Bye bye Naruto-chan, said Tenten ducking out the room as Naruto throw a sharp kunai at the door. End of memory. Ailee sat on a tree looking at Naruto. Her face didn't have her normal smile, but an odd look of curiosity. Naruto's aura was clam and green, not the normally chaotic red or the intense storm of black when angered. Tai Lee hopped out the tree and landed lightly next to the sleeping blonde. Tai Lee smiled at Naruto. You look like a sleeping fox, said Tai Lee, knowing Naruto could not hear her. She reached down to shake him awake, only to be caught in a light hug, as Naruto wrapped both his arms around her. Tenten one san whispered Naruto. Tai Lee blushed at how intimately she was being held by her friend, and unlike how Azula was possessive with her clutches, Naruto's were nice and loving, yet sad at the same time, but that was the furthest thought from Tai Lee's mind, as she slowly drifted off to sleep in the blonde's arms, to content to really try moving. Back inside Naruto's memories. Naruto was making his way to the festival with little on his mind. He wore a black and orange kimono with a dark red sleeveless hori over his shoulder, with a sign for Hokage on the back and on the left side of his chest. As he slowly walked people greeted him in a friendly manner, as children tried playing pranks on him to show off their mad ninja skills, as they like to call them. Naruto actually encouraged them to try and prank him and or others to get better and better with skills such as stealth and trap making. Naruto laughed as a youngster hit him with a water jutsu. My my Hokage-sama. Spending time with the children and trying to become a true role model for them, came a high voice that Naruto knew. Naruto smirked and turned to his sister-in-law Hanabi Hyuga. She was his cute little sister that had become a beautiful woman. She stood at the same height as her sister at 5'3", and she even grew to look more like Hinata, excerpt with black hair, her body was petite and tight, with compact muscles of a Kanoichi and B-cup priests. She wore a lavender furisode, with straw sandals and silk socks. In her hand was an elegant fan with a crane on it. Naruto whistled. Hot damn. You look good Nabi-chan. Said Naruto. Nabi blushed and gave her brother a small smack with her fan. Now now Rudo-kun. You're already having relations with my beloved sister, Anko-sama and Ino-san. Surely you don't need me. Naruto chuckled. I always wondered if you were as tight as Nada-chan, said Naruto making Hanabi blush. How crude of you Hokage-sama. To say such things in. Yelled Hanabi with a glint of playfulness in her eyes. Naruto bowed to her many many women giggle at how the clan head for the Hyuga had the Hokage in her back pocket. It would be my honor to escort you Lady Hyuga. Nanabi grabbed onto Naruto's arm with both of hers, and they began their track to the festival. So tell me how how things been with you Nabi-chan? Asked Naruto with a smile. Nanabi sighed. The Hyuga council is starting to try and push their weight around the village, because not only am I head of the family, but with Niji as the commander of the Henternin Corps, and Hinata as the head of the council, and wife of the Hokage, they think they have all the power, started Hanabi pausing for a minute. I've had to rein them in a few times, but it's starting to get bad, and even Niji is taking their side. He's starting to get back to his fate-obsessed self, said Hanabi. Naruto raised a brow at this. You're hiding something Hanabi, said Naruto. Hanabi sighed. She never could fool Naruto. They are threatening to replace me with Niji if I don't birth a child soon, Rudo kun said Hanabi. Naruto growled slightly. But you only just turned 19. I can show the elders their place if you wish, dear Hanabi, said Naruto letting out a bit of Kai. Hanabi smiled at her brother-in-law, knowing that he actually cared about her well-being. That won't be necessary, but thank you for the offer, Naruto kun said Hanab giving Naruto a small kiss on the cheeky. The duo settled in silence until they arrived at the openings of the festival. It had several games, prizes, and food stands, but the most famous attraction for the past five years had been the sixth Hokja's Origins Tales. Every year during the festival they would select a mission and act it out. This year they had chosen to do his most famous infamous wave mission. They had come to the part where Naruto had said Haku looked better, then Sakura making the people laugh at how silly their leader had been as a child. Anabi was giggling into her long sleeve while Naruto groaned at this. It was not one of his proudest moments as a ninja. Anabi looked at her brother and smirked. I think that was cute, Rudo-kun. 
Naruto gave Hanabi a mock glare. Don't start with me Nabi-chan, said Naruto. Yeah and Naruto-kun. It was funny. After all a gender-confused boy is much sexier than Sakura, said Tenten coming up with another female that made Naruto smile. It was Naruto's wife Hinata. Hinata stood even with her sister, but her frieze were much larger at just an F-cup, compared to Hanabi's DDs, her hair in contrast was blue, while her eyes while not the hue got traditional white, were more of a pale lavender. Her skin was as smooth as marble and pale skin that gave her a beauty that outshone that of her former teacher Kurina Yuhi. She wore a blue and orange furisode with a fox and a crane coddling together, a gift from Naruto of their last anniversary, Black Jetta, giving her an extra three inches in height, and around her neck was a pendant that her husband gave her the night of their wedding. Hanada walked up to Naruto and gave him a sound kiss on the lips, making her little sister blush and tent and giggle at her boss's red face as she pulled away. Naruto smiled at her a true smile and not one of his foxy smirks or grins. How was the council meeting Hina-chan? Asked Naruto wrapped in an arm around her waist. Hanada sat next to her husband. It was fine love. Though Haruno is starting up trouble trying to get me out of office, seeing as quote, the wife of our most honorable Hokage, and she already have a great deal of power being a member of the Hyuga clan as older sister to the clan head unquote. I swear to Kami-sama that I will beat the snot out of that little harpy if she keeps this up. Exclaimed Hinata pouting somewhat. Naruto got a glint in his eye as he looked at his wife for four years. Hinata caught the like and gave her husband a wink that promised what was already a good night would become a great night. For them at least. End of memory. Azula was breathing smoke from her nose as both Naruto and Tai Lee were missing. Azula for the most part was cunning and strong, but when it came to things like love and lust, she was a relative rookie, so the fact that both were missing was setting off all kinds of warning bells as what they could be doing. She could just picture it in her mind. Tai Lee's plump round ass bouncing up and down on Naruto Big C. Stop it. Just find them and see what they're up to, thought Azula as she looked at Mai who was sitting in a chair. Watch the camp. I'll be back in a few minutes, said Azula taking off without Mai even saying anything. Azula walked into the forest and began to look for Naruto and Tai Lee. They wouldn't have gone very far as they needed to leave soon lest they be found by a bossing sea patrol. A few minutes later she found them and nearly screamed in rage. Tai Lee was cuddled up next to Naruto, and Naruto was holding her closely on his lap. Azula's rage was about to reach a breaking point, but she held on. She walked close to them and shook Naruto and Tai Lee awake. What Azula? Asked an irritated Naruto as he had been in a rather deep sleep reliving his best memories. Why are you holding Tai Lee so intimately? Asked Azula. Naruto opened his eyes and looked at a heavily flushed Tai Lee. Naruto grinned. Maybe I grabbed her in my sleep. I had a tendency to do that to my wife's sister when she tried to wake me from my couch after a long day in the office, said Naruto. Azula felt the heat of her anger diminish some as Tai Lee scrambled out of his embrace. We should be going soon, said Azula. Naruto looked at her. We know the avatar is in Ba Sing Si, but how do you get inside a city that is considered impenetrable? Asked Naruto having never faced such a challenge in his long ninja career. Azula stopped. There are a few weaknesses in the wall if one looks right, said Azula. But the Kiyashi warriors. A young woman sighed as she cleaned off her ancestral katana. The woman in question could only be called beautiful. She had light brown eyes, black hair that was pulled into two buns, with only a few small bangs falling into her face. She was tall. Taller than most of the Kayashi warriors at 5'8 with cup priests clad in the traditional Kayashi warriors attire of ornate, armored green kimonos, metal headdresses, and white-faced makeup with red liner and black lipstick. The ancestral katana she admired was one of a kind even amongst the Kayashi warriors. It was shorter than the traditional katanas that were 32 inches long as hers was only 24 inches long, with a wave-like pattern on it. It had been a gift from a lord to her ancestor who she was named after. The name of the sword was Heavenly Angel, and desperate its name that blade had spilled more blood than any blade ever used in the history of her family. Denton. Came the voice of her leader and best friend. Denton stood as Lady Suki came to her. Denton sheathed her katana and looked at her. Lady Suki. Do you seek me? Asked Denton. Suki nodded at her with a smile on her face. Yes, Sister Tenten. I already told the others and now I need to tell you. We have been summoned to the palace as the honored guests of the Earth King Himslof. Tenten gasped. Even nobles had a hard time getting that request. By the spirits. What are we waiting for? We should tell that old hag to stuff it and leave. Said Tenten. As with all the other Kayashi warriors, Tenten found herself within great dislike of that witch at the toll booths. They had survived nearly round the clock ever since entering into the area as warriors and guards. Suki nodded. We'll be leaving in a few hours, said Suki. Tenten nodded and gathered her stuff together, although that was just a sleeping roll, her fans, and a arm bracer with a folding shield inside of it. 
she met with the others and nodded to them with her gaze lingering on the only earthbender in the group. A true child of Kayashi as the villagers liked to call her. Her name was Suli. Suli was easily one of the most beautiful women on Kayashi next to Suki and herself. Her dark brown eyes were almond-shaped and low in a way that made people underestimate her, her hair was much longer than that of a normal Kayashi warrior's, as it was tradition to keep it short. Hers was long and pulled into a high ponytail, but still reached the middle of her back, with bangs framing her face, she stood at 5'4 with cup priests and wore the traditional Kayashi warrior's attire. To cap things off she was an earthbender whose skills were said to rival those of the blind bandits form the earth rumble tournaments. Sister Su Li, said Tenton bowing slightly. Nai hao sister Tenton, said Su Li bowing back to the slightly older girl. Suki looked at her sister warriors and nodded to them. All right let's move out we have a two week long track ahead of us, said Suki. Memory. Tenton sat in a bed tired, exhausted, and ready to pass out, but not before she held her child. My baby, whispered Tenton holding on to the black-haired baby boy that was just born. The boy had strong lungs as indicated by his wails of life. The nod aside as she removed her gloves and operation gear, she turned to Shizune, who had personally overseen the birth of the beautiful baby boy. Shizune please mark that, started Hinata. Heighten. Heighten Higurashi, said Tenton looking at her baby. Hinata nodded. That Heighten Higurashi was born as 10. 28 a.m. Of September 18 and weighed 7 pounds 3 ounces, said Hinata. Naruto smiled at his assistant friend. You did a good job Tenton, Naruto taking a hold of her one hand and petting it gently, almost like a loving boyfriend or husband, but that was not the case. Tenton and Naruto simply understood each other. Tenton looked at her friend. What are you talking about? I didn't do anything other women couldn't have done, said Tenton tiredly. Naruto smiled at this. Exactly. Just as if we are day and night men are made to destroy and women to create. You have a power no man will ever have Tenton. Lee would be very proud, said Naruto. Tenton felt a teardrop from her eye at the praise. Lee had died during a S-ranked mission to protect a noble that had been targeted for assassination by a band of Ru shinobi. Of course he was not the only one to die. Choji, Ami, Hana and Sai had all met their ends on that mission, with only Niji and Sakura surviving. That mission had been nearly three months ago, and neither of them had fully recovered. An Anbu member appeared in the room, and Naruto turned to him with a glare. This better be important to interrupt the little time I have to spend with my family, said Naruto with a frown making the Anbu member flinch. The Anbu who had a hawk mask gulped. Yuzumaki-sama. The elder council wishes to speak with you on matters tending to the civilian council, said Naruto. Naruto growled, but gave a smile to Heighten. Rest well Heighten kun said Naruto as he walked out of the room, never seeing the baby's brown eyes open to stare at him. Memory end. Tsuki, Tenten, and Su Li, as well as their other three sisters, picked berries as they were planning on stopping for a few moments. Tsuki how much longer before we reach the capital? Asked Su Li. It should only be another three or four days at this track, said Tsuki. And that's if we don't stop every four hours for a break, said Tenten giving a glare to the girl. Su Li laughed. You know as well as I do that these barriers are more for medical use, said Su Li taking one and eating it. Tsuki. Yelled one of her other sisters. The three drew their blades and rushed over to Isis. The best tracker of all the Kayashi warriors. Isis for unknown reasons was the tallest of the Kayashi warriors standing at about 5'10 with more moderate B-cup priests, her brown hair was pulled back into a topknot, after all had gathered she walked up to Suki and gave her some fur pure white fur. Suki's eyes widened at this. Appa. Whispered Suki. Fenton and Suli looked at each other. Who's Appa? Asked Suli. Suki turned to her sister warriors. You two were on a mission at the time on the mainland. Appa is the I guess you could say guardian animal of Avatarong, said Suki. Isis nodded. Yes they saved the village from a Fire Nation raid. Not to mention that Suki allowed herself to be filled with the seed of that water tribe boy, said Isis with her monotone of voice. Suki blushed, but thanks to her war makeup you couldn't tell. Stay focused Isis. Track Appa. He might be in danger. Said Suki. The group tracked Appa to a hollowed out tree where he growled at them. Suki came out of the bush and walked forward. Appa. It's me. Suki, said Suki holding out her hands. Appa looked at her hands and sniffed her, before rubbing his head against her in a comforting gesture. Suki smiled and hugged Appa. Let's get you cleaned up. Okay. Asked Suki. Sometime later. The Kayashi warriors had managed to get the quills out and wash him off the blood, mud, and dirt on his fur. Su Li petted his head. There that's better, said Su Li as Appa licked her gently making the other warriors laugh. The moment is short-lived as a stream of blue fire hits a tree nearby. The Kayashi warriors grab one of their small battle fans in their right hand and unfold their arm-mounted shields on the left arm. 
they got into a defensive formation around Appa with their shields forward and their fans held high. Three Mongus lizards appear with three people riding them and a fourth in a tree. The one in the tree jumped down and landed about 15 feet away from them. See Azula? I told you that the avatar's pet was in the area, said Naruto smirking. Azula smirked as well. Yes, Naruto. I see you were correct, said Azula. Before stepping off of her Mongus dragon. We'd rather not force the issue so hand over the avatar's pet or get burned, said Azula as she snapped her fingers making a blue spark. Tenten growled. Over our dead bodies, said Tenten drawing the attention of Naruto. Naruto's eyes narrowed. Azula back away. I can handle this alone, just get the bison, said Naruto. Azula looked at Naruto having never heard him speak like that. Very well, but I reserve the right to attack at any time, said Azula. Naruto cracked his knuckles. Deal. It's been a while since I used any of my shinobi skills in battle. Let's see how these geisha rejects handle this, said Naruto. Suki looked at Naruto with a deep ire as being called a geisha, but compassed herself expecting a firebending attack. Naruto charged forward and right at Isis. Isis swung her fan at Naruto, only for him to vanish and a log to appear in his place. Isis barely brought up her shield to stop the powerful punch that not only broke her shield, but shattered her wrist. Isis grunted in pain as she hit the ground. She did a spinning rise kick with just her right arm, only for two Naruto's to grab her arms and fold them behind her back painfully. Isis. Yelled Su Li anger clear in her voice as she charged at the two Naruto's, before the real Naruto appeared before her and hit her with a haymaker that sent her skidding back into Tenten. Are you alright? Asked Tenten helping her younger Kayashi sister to her feet. Su Li nodded, before spitting out a mouth full of blood. I sister, but I think it would take all of us to beat him, said Su Li. Naruto had his full attention focused on them fully aware that Tai Li and Mai had already taken care of two girls foolish enough to challenge them, while Azula was taking care of the leader, as the bison had already escaped. You girl, started Naruto pointing to Tenten. What is your name as your voice is too close to home for my liking? My name is Tenten. I was named after my ancestor who was a noble woman and a great warrior, said Tenten drawing her sword. Heavenly angel. Naruto eyed the sword with anger. A blade given to a traitor and a girl named after a power hungry for, said Naruto charging forward. Tsuli hit the ground and made a wall appear before herself and Tenten, but the wall was nothing in seconds, as Naruto appeared holding a blue swirling orb. And thrust it at Tenten. Tenten gasped and brought her sword up stopping the attack as a grinding noise was heard. Tsuli capitalized on this by making sending a earth line at Naruto. Naruto jumped back at the last second and appeared in a tree. Tenten put her hands together before launching Su Li into the air with Tenten following shortly. Naruto sat on a branch and waited for them. As they stood in battle positions Naruto rose and just glanced at them. More importantly Tenten. What do you know of my ancestor? Asked Tenten. Naruto closed his eyes. Your ancestor Higurashi Tenten was a beautiful woman. The same as you. She was not only the bodyguard of my wife, but one of the only women I could truly call sister. I put my trust into her like no other, and what does she do? Asked Naruto slapping his chest and opening his now angered eyes. She ripped it apart and killed my wife. Tenten was stunned into silence and had to try and take this in, but Naruto coming at her with nothing but pure malice made her raise her blade in defense as Su Li raised her fans. Tenten stopped Naruto's punch with the flat of her sword, but Su Li caught a kick that sent her into a tree, making her hit her head and knocking her out. As she fell a clone of Naruto caught her. Naruto jumped away and gathered wind chakra to his lungs. Wine style. Drilling air bullet yelled Naruto firing at the girl. Tenten gasped before jumping out of the way and into the air before looking around for Naruto. Ceiling style. Bound body jutsu, said Naruto making Tenten's body seize up before falling forward onto her knees. Tenten glared at Naruto as he lifted her body to a standing position August the tree. Bastard. Naruto looked at her. Wind style. Kiss of death, said Naruto putting his lips to Tenten's. Tenten's eyes widened before she began to feel lightheaded and everything went black. She fell forward allowing Naruto to catch her. Naruto jumped down and joined Azula and the others, just as they finished tying up the girls. Is she dead? Asked Azula. Naruto shook his head. Just unconscious. I want her alive, said Naruto. His tone is cold as the color of his eyes. Mai looked at Naruto. Plan on taking another bed warmer? Asked Mai slightly heated. Naruto looked at Mai. No. Her looks and appearance are too close to my tentons to be a coincidence. If she is the reincarnation of Tenten then I can find out what happened and why she betrayed me and my wife, said Naruto setting her down. Ai Li stepped forward and put a hand on Naruto's shoulder. It's in the past. Let it go, said Tai Li. Naruto angered at what the girl said spun around and grabbed her by her neck lifting her into the air. Let it go. Yelled Naruto as he saw tears of pain appear in Tai Li's eyes. 
the woman who was my best friend killed my wife. The only woman to ever love me and not just the things I could do in bed. And you expect me to just let it go. Yelled Naruto demonic energy starting to bleed into his voice. A soft hand found its way to his hand. Naruto looked at Mai as she held it. That's not true Naruto. I love you, said Mai in a quiet voice. Naruto let go of Tai Lee who coughed a bit and massaged her soon to be brussied neck. I'm sorry Tai Lee, but I can't let this go. Not like this, said Naruto walking away from the girls with Mai following. By a small river. The way the river flowed and the trees swayed reminded Naruto of the old training ground 7. How he missed those days. How he missed his god brother sensei Kakashi. How he missed his godmother grandma mother figure Tsunade. How he missed his loved one so much. Naruto felt a pair of arms wrap around his waist and a headrest on his back. His shirt becoming wet from the tears of the girl hugging him. I don't ever throw those words around casually again. I know you're using me to distract you from the world, but started Naruto. Shut up, said Mai so quietly that Naruto almost missed it. Just shut up. I've come to love you more than I thought I could. I've always seen the world as a dark and miserable place. You're one of the only bright spots in it, so don't tell me that I'm throwing anything around, said Mai. Naruto spun around and looked at Mai black eyes met blue in a heated stare, before Mai leaned up and kissed Naruto on his lips. Mai's hands found their way around Naruto's neck, while Naruto's hands found her waist. Both pulled back from the kiss, and Naruto smiled at Mai. I love you my beautiful Kurohim, said Naruto. Mai gave a rare smile to the man she loved. Oh she could get used to that. I love you as well my powerful dragon fox. Back with the group a few hours later. Mai and Naruto arrived to see a group of Fire Nation soldiers taking the Kayashi warriors in Fire Nation. It appeared that they had been stripped of their armor and put in prisoners tunics and pants, with a few of the male soldiers looking at them. Naruto was truly not inclined to care, because he had seen females under his commander be captured and rescued months, and even sometimes years later. Pregnant or suicidal as the things that they had to do. Naruto put a hand on the captain's shoulder. Should anything happen to them you will know my wrath, said Naruto. The captain gulped, but bowed to Naruto. Naruto didn't know why he felt sympathy for them. This was war and things such as this happened in war. Naruto looked at Tenten who had to be carried into the prison transport. Naruto-kun forgive me, said Tenten. Naruto ran over and grabbed her from the guard and set her on the ground. Naruto put his hand on Tenten's head. If she is a reincarnation then maybe I can drag her memories to the surface, thought Naruto. It was a risky trick that Ino had taught to him as memories as Ino had told him took a life all their own. And dragging up a person's memories, be they amnesia or another life was very dangerous. Mind arts. Memory resurface jutsu, said Naruto. Memory. Tenten was thrown to the ground by none other than Niji Hyuga and Sakura Haruno. Niji as naked as the day he was born and Sakura with a grin on her face. Tenten felt so dirty at this time. Tenten had been tending to her now six-month-old child when Niji and Sakura had come over. Niji had been pressing her for a while to get over Lee and become his woman, but more than a few times she flat out refused. Sakura herself had tried to convince her as a friend that it was time to move on. Tenten simply had not been ready for another relationship. It seemed that Niji had finally gotten tired and just forced himself on her. Tenten fought the whole way, but she felt every kiss, every grope, every slap and every thrust of his manhood into her vagina. More than a few times he had emptied himself inside of Tenten as he called her Naruto slut is demon 4. Tenten glared at the two people who she thought were her friends. Are you done yet Niji because I'm going to kill you both, said Tenten as her hand went under her couch for heavenly angel. Sakura pulled a kunai and held it to Hyten's belly, making him cry and freezing Tenten. Out of everything she had Hyten was one of the few things that she wouldn't gamble with. That's better Tenten. Now you are to continue being Niji's plaything as well as my instrument to Hokage-sama's downfall, said Sakura with a sick smirk on her face. Tenten didn't know it, but she was crying. Crying at the thought of betraying her brother and of losing her son. What do you want me to do Sakura-sama? Asked Tenten in a voice that clearly showed she was defeated. Sakura smirked. Everything I say, said Sakura. Memory end. Naruto watched as Tenten did everything that Sakura told her to do and be Niji's plaything for the next five years of her life, until she was told to kill Hinata. Naruto pulled back and had to hold back his own tears. And all this time she regretted it, said Naruto in a quiet whisper. Niji and Sakura were very lucky at this point. If he knew the Inper World Resurrection then he would drag their souls back to the mortal realm. Even if they were already rotting in the darkest foulest pits of hell. He knew that for the next eternity after he died he would be kicking ass. Naruto looked at the girl before carrying her over to the carrier. He turned around and started to walk away. I forgive you Tentani chan said Naruto to no one, but himself as a tear rolled down his face. Not truly caring that Mai, Tai Lee, and Asla saw the tears. 
Azula had done anything in her conquests of the Earth Kingdom and other such things that she detested or disagreed with, but what she was doing currently was the icing on the cake. Even with Ty Lee and Mai doing so, it was still demeaning to her. I refuse to wear that that abomination. Said Azula glared at Mai, Ty Lee, and Naruto as the aforementioned girls now wore the Kayashi warriors' clothes and armor, as well as face paint. But you have to Azula. Hell Ty Lee and Mai actually had to modify the armor slightly to accommodate for their bigger feasts, said Naruto, making both girls blush. Don't say such things Naruto or I'll use you as my target dummy, said Mai holding out one of her knives. I think it's sweet Mai, said Ty Lee. Mai snorted. Please. It's only sweet, because Naruto is I humping the shit out of your ass right now, said Mai Magnic Ty Lee blush the color of Azula's armor. Azula glared at Naruto. I am the first princess of the Fire Nation. I'd sooner cut my own tongue out than wear those Earth Kingdom rags, said Azula. Naruto sighed and rubbed his head. You're not making this easy Azula Haim, said Naruto. Mai stepped up. Azula put the damn thing on. I'd rather have this mission over with sometime this year, said Mai rather annoyed by the whole damn thing. Azula was about to retant, but Naruto held up his hand. Listen Azula either put the damn clothes on, or I will make you put them on, said Naruto getting an evil glint in his eyes. Haile blushed at this. Azula normally wore one article of underclothing. Her imagination running rampant with the things Naruto would do to Azula. Azula herself didn't want to do it, but she knew that Naruto was more than capable of what he said. She grabbed the clothes and starting to take off her custom armor. Talked down to by my own champion. How embarrassing, said Azula to no one specific. Ty Lee looked at Naruto. Naruto what about you? Asked Ty Lee. She knew how she, Azula and Mai would get in, but Naruto was a different matter altogether. Naruto rubbed his neck. I'm going to help with the interrogation of the Kayashi warriors, said Naruto. Mai, Azula, who had finished dressing, and Ty Lee all looked at him with a deadpanned expression. No offense Naruto, but we've already done that, said Mai. Naruto shook his head. There's still some things I want to know. In case something happens I'll be coming back within the week. We are strong together and while I'm sure I could possibly demolish the city if I tried hard enough I'd rather avoid that option if possible, said Naruto. This way I'll have everything properly sorted within a week. That's the travel time for you girls anyway. No need to rush, said Naruto. He's right, besides Naruto has more than likely come up with his own plans, said Ty Lee sticking up for Naruto. Naruto nodded, before looking to the sun. It's getting late. You three better get to the transport, said Naruto turning around. Once Naruto was out of earshot Ty Lee turned to her friends with a worried expression on her face. I'm worried about Naruto, said Ty Lee biting her lip. Mai looked at Ty Lee with a slight bit of annoyance which signified she was getting angry. What do you mean Ty Lee? Asked Mai. Ty Lee looked down. She loved Mai like a sister, and she really didn't want to be the one to tell her friend that her boyfriend lover was having doubts and starting to second-guessing himself. With Naruto. Naruto stopped in the tree line and slammed his fist into it in pure anger, not even noticing the blood dripping from the scars. What the hell am I doing? Asked Naruto though gritted teeth. All his life he had been oppressed and battled tyrants, but here he was helping a tyrant nation try and suck eating and taking over the entire world. He had been oppressed by Kanoha because they feared the Kayubi, he had helped Wave rid themselves of Gato, he had killed his first lover Koyuki's uncle for her. Naruto fell to his knees. So what the hell am I doing Jiriya? I thought I was supposed to bring peace to the world. Yelled Naruto before falling onto his hands and letting a tear fall from his eye. Instead I found that I turned my back on my sister, said Naruto. Naruto needed someone to talk to. Someone from his time. Even better. Naruto bit his thumb and ran though the hand signs. Summoning Jutsu. Yelled Naruto. The large cloud of smoke appeared and out of the smoke a head rose. What come out of the smoke was the most elegant Chinese dragon one would ever see. The dragon was easily 300 feet long, with long arms and legs currently sitting on all four. It was an all pink gem color, spring green colored eyes, long black hair that fell to its waist with a few strands of white in it. Long snout with fangs patruding from its mouth, a clearly femininity defined chest, wearing a red battle kimono with a white obi sash. The dragon eyed Naruto and looked at him with a sort of fondness in her eyes. Naruto. My favorite human youngling. It has been too long. I thought you lost to us, but the connection never truly died. Yelled the great dragon. Naruto smiled. Hello dragon queen Arya. It has been too long, said Naruto bowing to her. Arya frowned. Rise youngling. There is no bound between equals such as us, said Arya. Naruto stood. I called you here to talk. Would it be alright if you became your human form? Asked Naruto. Arya nodded before she started to shrink. Within a minute only a woman stood before Naruto. The woman in question could have put many women from his time and this one to shame. 
She easily stood at 5'6 with impressive long legs and a generous DD cup size to her frieze with an hourglass figure, her eyes were still the same spring green color, but in her human form held much more warmth than the sun, she wore a pink kimono with the kanji for dragon on the back, with the side slightly open showing off a large amount of her cleavage. Sandals and socks with a long scarf and an obi sash. Naruto walked forward and embraced her. It is good to see you again great mother, said Naruto. Arya returned the embrace. My son it is so wonderful to see you again, said Arya pulling away. Let me take a look at you, spoke Arya before giving Naruto a once over. Like all summoned creatures the dragons had their clan organized in a specific way. Well the toads ran around like a yakuza gang, the slugs a medical unit, and the snakes a crazed killing cult, the dragons preferred to think of their summoners as family. Naruto himself was brother to almost 50 younger dragons and father of three because of a chakra fusion he did to three eggs. Arya had accepted Naruto after her test. A test of no fear truth to not only her, but himself. Out of the hundreds who signed the contract, Naruto was only the fifth to live though Arya's test. All in all you look good for an old man, said Arya teasing Naruto with a sexy smirk and wink. Naruto smirked back at her. And you're probably the hottest milf I've ever wanted, said Naruto. Both laughed as they took a seat on the tree Arya wrapping Naruto up in her arms. They sat silently for a long time. Arya enjoying having her son back in her arms and Naruto enjoying being in the company of an old friend. You know the first time I held you like this you almost passed out from blood loss, said Arya in a kind voice. Naruto chuckled. I was 16 and you were just too hot for me to handle, said Naruto with a grin. Arya smiled and stroked his hair with affection. What is troubling you my favorite human son? Asked Arya. Naruto sighed as the wind blow a cool breeze. It was nice and calm, but his thoughts were nothing but a raging storm on the open waters of the sea. He looked at Arya. Damnation. I was to bring peace to the world, yet somehow I brought it to its knees, said Naruto still looking at the skies as if they held the answers to his questions. Arya patted his head. Hush child. You are not the first and will not be the last. The Sage of Six Paths saved the world from the Juubi, but in the process created the Nine Demons, the Achiha and Senju clans worked together to create Konoha to stand as a sign of peace, but ended up fighting the Second Great War. Your father and mother gave their lives to seal Kayubi inside of you, but you were treated as a hated being. You fought to protect the world from Akatsuki and Sasuke Uchiha and ended up having to kill many to protect yourself and your mates. The toads are wise, but were wrong about many things. For there to be black and there must be white, for there to be peace there must be war. Always both, never one. Even during peaceful times. Even during the 13 year peace between the villages, there were still conflicts in the world. Naruto nodded. Wave, spring, tea, mist, and many other lands, said Naruto. Arya nodded. Yes and you had many powerful and influential women craving your touch your attention, said Arya. And still the only women I ever wanted to give me children never could, said Naruto. Arya kissed Naruto's head. Don't worry my son unlike the peace that can never be you will have children as you wise. For now do what you must do Naruto and our clan shall support you be it for peace or war, said Arya. Naruto smiled. Thank you. Mother, said Naruto as Arya vanished in a puff of smoke. Three days later Fire Nation prison camp. Fenton gasped as she lost her breath to a brutal punch to her stomach courtesy of the captain of the prison camp, she and the other Kayashi warriors were staying in until the campaign against Ba Sing Si was over. Weak little fish. Yelled the captain kicking Fenton in her gut. Fenton spat up blood as she was thrown across the yard, landing a good ten feet away from where she started. She slowly rose and looked at the guard though bloody teeth and scared face. The captain looked at her with a grin. He was a sadistic bastard. Hold her up and strip her shirt. Yelled the man as two guards came up and ripped her shirt off. Am she gots a nice set of tits on her. Said one of the guards pawing at Tenton, making her growl. Get your hands off of my chest. Yelled Tenton. Better than the other girls do. I bet she's still a virgin, said guard too. Tenton blushed at their remarks and the leers that she was getting from around the courtyard. So far she had heard rumors of the things done in Fire Nation prison camps, especially to young and pretty girls. So far she and the others had been lucky. Maybe you two can take her for a test run later. For now I'm going to make her and the others fear my whip. Smirked the captain, before removing his whip. Fenton kept a brave face as he raised his whip and it cut through the air hitting Tenton in the face. It hurt, but Tenton refused to cry in pain. The next hit that came was across the top of her chest. She nearly winced, but held it in. The next hit flow and came at her, but before it hit a figure appeared between her and the whip as it wrapped around someone's arm. I hope that you weren't going to hurt her too bad, said Naruto with a smile. The captain backpedaled looking at him and saluting. General Naruto. Had I known you were coming I would have been better prepared, said the captain. Naruto looked around the camp. If you could really call it that. 
It was a mostly wooden base that was built mostly to handle earthbenders. It was a good seven stories tall with about 700 cells, half of them with more than two occupants. He could also smell the stale scent of sex. Naruto nodded. I understand, Captain. You had no notice of my arrival, said Naruto holding out his hand to the captain. The captain sighed in relief and took Naruto's hand, only to explode into a million pieces. Wine style. Vortex cutting blade, said Naruto as the other two guards exploded as well. Naruto looked around at the stunned guards and regretted killing the three of them so quickly. He looked around before pointing to a man with an eye patch over his right eye. You. Yelled Naruto. The man straightened up. Yes sir. Yelled the man, officially left eye. You are now commanding officer of this place. I want this young lady cleaned up and brought to my quarters for dinner, said Naruto stalking off. Left eye nodded before helping Tenten to her feet. Tenten looked at Naruto with a sense of confusion. On one hand he was a brutal warrior and another a young man with sad eyes if one looked close enough. But Azula, Mai, and Tai Lee. Azula walked over to the bed of the inn they were staying in and collapsed in it. The track to the gate was oh so annoying. They had been met by a group of 30 earthbenders, checked for Fire Nation weapons, a pat down by perverts nearly making Azula lose her temper, and then being led to Tian, because the Earth King would be busy for the next day or so due to politics. Mai sat at the vanity mirror, before washing her face with a bowl of warm water and a rag. I so hate this makeup, said Mai. Tylee giggled. Why? I think it's nice seeing you with something other than black, said Tylee. Mai frowned, before throwing her arm at Tylee. Tai Lee brought her palms together and caught the throwing knife with ease. Tai Lee frowned at her friend. You're getting slow if I was able to catch your sharp blade, said Tai Lee stabbing it into the desk. Mei smirked. Then I won't go so easy next time, said Mai. Azula sat up. Get some sleep girls. We've infiltrated the strongest city in the Earth Kingdom, and now we have to take it down, said Azula. But Tenten. Tenten was escorted to Naruto's private quarters that once belonged to the commander of the base. Tenten had been washed and dressed by the female attendants. Her hair had been pulled into a single bun, while she now wore a Fire Nation female dress robe. A guard stopped and opened the door to the private chamber. The general is inside awaiting you, said the guard. Knowing she couldn't fight her way out of it, she entered the room and looked around as the guard closed the door behind her. There were several swords including her own mounted on the wall and a small table with soup and other parts to a meal. Tenten went to her sword thinking that maybe she could use it to free her sisters and other prisoners. Don't, came Naruto's voice as he came out of another door wearing a Fire Nation count suit. Tenten reached for it and pulled it off the wall, only to find that her arm was pulled back with a hand on her neck. Tenten let out a small cry of pain at this. As she tried to look back at Naruto. Damn you. Said Tenten in a strained voice. Naruto tightened his grip on her arm, making her drop the sword. Naruto released Tenten by shoving her into the wall. Tenten spun around and glared at Naruto. Naruto ignored her in favor of picking the blade up and sheathing it. We both know I can and will beat you so be a good guest and seat yourself to a meal. Don't turn this into a losing fight, said Naruto. Tenten blushed in anger, before bowing to Naruto. I thank you for this evening general, said Tenten. Naruto bowed back. Thank you Lady Tenten. Tenten blushed at this. I'm not Lady. That title is reserved for the leader of the Kayashi warriors. A position which I'm afraid is years away from me, said Tenten. Naruto nodded before taking a seat as did Tenten. Tenten nearly drooled at the small of the food, ever since she arrived she had been given nothing but gruel and slop. She had refused to eat, suspecting that the food of the female prisoners had been tampered with in some way. Tenten looked up from her meal at Naruto with an even stare. You're different from the other Fire Nation troops I've seen, said Tenten. After leaving Kayashi to travel to Ba Sing Si she had seen many evils. Camps where women were used as nothing more than sex toys and men target practice. She and the others had freed some of the camps, but not all of them. Some were too well guarded while others had more than a few masters of not only fire bending, but other powerful martial arts and weapons training. Naruto looked at her. It's true. I'm not like them because I've seen too much of this in my lifetime to care for it and wish for it to end, said Naruto. I'm tired of wars breaking out because of greed and power hungry fools. It should have ended during the age of shinobi, but I see that hate carried over to another age. Denton frowned at him. What do you mean age of shinobi? That is just a legend told to children who wish to become strong, said Tenten having heard the tales of powerful eyes, bodies unyielding, and people who could rival if not outright destroy the avatar in a battle. Naruto sighed. The age of shinobi was real. I fought in four or five wars and many more rebellions than I care to think about. I was according to my godfather the child that would bring peace or utter ruination to the world. I did both and that was just in my first 15 years of life. Tenten looked at Naruto in shock. How can you have seen too much of it in your lifetime when you're probably no older than me? 
asked Tenton. Naruto smirked. Actually my true age is 2025, but who has time to count nowadays, said Naruto taking a sip of his soup. Tenton looked at him in shock. But how? You look so young. Asked Tenton. Naruto shrugged. In truth I don't even know myself. Maybe it was from a combination of seals used to keep me locked away, and the fact I had a demon sealed inside my body when I was born, but here I am, and here I shall stay, said Naruto. Tenton was silent for a moment. May I ask you something? Asked Tenton. Naruto looked at her. Go ahead and ask girl, said Naruto. In all of your life you must have seen some powerful weapons, said Tenton. After Naruto nodded she went on. What is the best weapon you ever seen or held? Naruto closed his eyes as if in thought. The strength of one soul one person can change the world for better or worse, how much depends on the strength of their convictions, said Naruto. Tenton thought he had finished, until he opened his eyes and stared right back at her. Those who easily lose sight of their goal and ideals, always fall those who stay with it and fight their hardest are immortal through the memories of those around them. That is the strongest of all weapons. What about your allegiance to the Fire Nation? To Princess Azula? Asked Tenton spitting out the word Princess. What about it? Said Naruto once again shocking the Kayashi warrior. My allegiance is to Azula alone. That's like asking me about my alliance to the Earth Kingdom. If I was loyal to one man or woman. It would be to that person and not the whole nation, said Naruto. Tenton stood up in anger. But you've killed Earth Kingdom troops in cold blood. Yelled Tenton her fist shaking. Naruto nodded. I have as it was my job. I would do it again and again, unless Azula ordered me to stop, said Naruto giving a small laugh. Like she sold truly order that. Tenton grit her teeth but their people. Yelled Tenton. Naruto frowned. And so are Fire Nation troops. They knew what they were doing when they signed up to do battle. A Solider is trained to fight and die for their nation, said Naruto. Tenton stood. Maybe that's how you were trained, but we, started Tenton only for Naruto to slam his hand on the table. Enough. Yelled Naruto making Tenton back up. You obvious don't get it. Where I come from we are taught the art of assassination, military tactics, and other such things. If you can't understand such things then you're just as much a silly little girl as the avatar is a naive little boy, said Naruto. Tenton growled, but didn't continue the conversion with Naruto. Tenton stood and bowed to Naruto. If you'll excuse me, said Tenton knocking on the door as two guards appeared and lead her back to her cell. Two days later. Naruto sat at his table writing a few orders when a man walked into his office. Naruto looked at the man. He wore green robes with gold trim and the Earth Kingdom sign on the front, black pants, rock gloves and shoes. Naruto dipped his pen and looked at the man. His skills at infiltration were at least chunin, but Naruto was so much more and noticed him the second he entered the camp. You're not here to try and kill me, so I assume you're not an assassin, said Naruto looking at the man. The man bowed. I am an agent of the Dai Li. I was sent by Lady Azula and Long Fang to deliver this to you, said the man placing a scroll on the desk. Naruto picked it up and opened the scroll. Naruto. We've captured the Water Tribe girl. Return to my side immediately. We have to plan the fall of the Avatar. Azula. Naruto just smirked at the letter. How long will it take us to return to Ba Sing Si? Asked E. Naruto. The day at most sir, said the man. Naruto rose from his seat. Then let us leave, said Naruto. Naruto walked into the throne room to see the Dai Li standing before Azula and a man with a rather long braid wearing a green robe. He noticed the small signs of battle and realized that Azula, Mai and Tai Li did not need his assistance to capture the seat of power in the city. Thank you for your assistance in taking over the city Princess Azula. Now comes the part where I double-cross you. Dai Li, arrest the Fire Nation Princess. Said the man calmly and in a commanding voice. None of the agents moved from their position to executive the order given surprising the man. I said, arrest her. What is the meaning of this? Asked the man. I'll tell you the meaning of this. They're at a crossroads, said Naruto walking into the light and besides Azula. Naruto what kept you love? Asked Azula sarcastically. Naruto smirked. I'm sorry my sweet Azula. I was rather busy at the prison camp, said Naruto hugging her from behind by wrapping one arm around her waist and the other on her arm. Azula shivered at this. She could feel it in her bones, the pleasure of his skin on hers, but now was not the time for such things as time was of the essence. She quickly removed herself from Naruto and walked close to the throne. It's because they haven't made up their minds. They're waiting to see how this is going to end Long Fang, said Azula. What are you talking about? Asked the man now identified as Long Fang. Azula started dead into Long Fang's eyes. Cold amber meeting cold and confused black. I can see your whole history in your eyes. You were born with nothing. So you had to struggle and connive and claw your way to power. But true power the divine right to rule is something you're born with. 
The fact is, they don't know which one of us is going to be sitting on that throne and which one is going to be bowing down. But I know. And you know, said Azula. Naruto smirked at Long Fang seeing the man sweat in fear of Azula. Granted Azula was an amazing woman, but all her amazement came in the form of a viper ready to strike. Naruto glanced at Azula and saw her sit down on the throne crossing her legs in a single cold flourish. Naruto turned back to Long Fang. Well Long Fang. What shall you do? Asked Naruto. Long Fang was now truly frightened. Even if by some small miracle he defeated Princess Azula there was still the wild card. Her servant who the men have called a demon in human skin. Long Fang closes his eyes and drops his head, realizing that he has lost. Long Fang steps forward and bows before Azula. You have beaten me at my own game Princess Azula, said Log Feng. Azula gave him a cold smile. Don't flatter yourself. You were never even a player. An hour later. Naruto stood in front of a few Dai Li agents. About 15 of them. Azula had stated that it would be best if Naruto took the strongest of them and made them his personal soldiers. He only found 15 that were worth mentioning. They were all barely above Chunin, but just strong enough to do what needed to be done. I want you 15 to prepare for the entrance of the Fire Nation army, said Naruto. How sir? Asked the leader of the Dai Li. Naruto looked at him. What is your name? Asked Naruto. The man straightened up. Sir we forfeit our names upon entry into the Dai Li, said the man. Naruto nodded. I see, well from now on your name is Sasuke. Here's how it works. Azula has already told the others to take out those guarding the wall. Once done you shall open the gates of hell and allow the Fire Nation entrance to the city, said Naruto. Sasuke nodded, before turning around and telling his men to move out. Naruto turned away and walked into the palace. Things were moving along smoothly. Azula was already taking care of her troublesome relatives, Mai was travailing to the wall with the aforementioned Dai Li to take out the gate troops, and Tai Li was taking care of any guards wandering around. This leaves me with nothing to do for the time being, said Naruto heading towards the throne room. Naruto sat on the throne with Azula in his lap and a large robe draped over them. Azula was looking at Naruto wondering what happened and why she allowed herself to have sex with Naruto. It was really the last thing she wanted to think about as she drifted off to sleep. The blonde looked down at the princess before standing and walking to her chambers. It took him the better part of 15 minutes to get there, but once there he stopped at the door. No one is to enter these chambers without mine or Azula's permission, said Naruto to the Dai Li agents in hiding around them. The room they were in was truly fit for a king. The room itself was shaped 100 by 50, the bed was massive a good 20 feet with emerald green sheets, the wall were decorated with paintings and weapons from various ages and places around the world. Naruto laid Azula on the bed before going though the closet and pulling out a pair of silk hakama, a jade kimono top with a golden dragon on it. Naruto looked at himself in the full-length mirror and thought that it looked pretty good on him. So did Azula if the looks he was getting was any indication. Asla got off the bed and pulled a large robe around her and walked up to Naruto swinging her hips in a seductive manner. She ran her hands over his arms and face before giving him a kiss. You look like a king wearing such clothes, said Asla, her eyes racking over his body. Naruto grabbed Asla by her hips and pulled her into him before lifting her up and pushing her onto the wall and kissing her. Asla moaned as one of her feet touched the ground while Naruto's hands found her ass. She wanted, no craved his touch on her body, and she wanted to take whatever she could get from her champion. Bang bang bang. Naruto's lips pulled away from Azula's as both growled in anger. What is it? Yelled Azula as Naruto pulled away and she closed her robe. The Dai Li agent entered and bowed. Forgive the intrusion me lady and me lord, but I thought it would be prudent to tell you that the Avatar and General Iroh will be approaching the Forbidden City in a matter of moments. Naruto and Azula looked at each other, and while not saying anything their tactical minds allowed them to have a mental conversation. Azula walked over to a female closet and pulled out a pair of silk pants that were tied on her body, a pair of dragonfly boots, a no-sleeved green silk robe that went to her knees, and a yellow sash. Naruto nodded as he and Azula followed the agent to the underground passage. Is there anything I should do Lady Azula? Asked the man. Azula looked at him. Gather the other Dai Li agents. I think it's time I had a talk with my brother and my new water tribe pet, said Azula with a wicked smile on her face. But Zuko and Katara. Katara paced behind Zuko with a more than pissed off expression on her face as she turned to him. Why did they throw you in here? Oh wait. Let me guess. It's a trap. So when Ong shows up to rescue me, you can finally have him in your little Fire Nation clutches. Yelled Katara. Zuko turned around to face Katara. He gave the briefest of glances before turning back around, leaving a small silence between them. You're a terrible person, you know that. Always following us, hunting Ong, trying to capture the world's last hope for peace. But what do you care? You're the Fire Lord's son. Spreading war and violence and hatred is in your blood. Rage Katara. 
You don't know what you're talking about, said Zuko just above a whisper. I don't. How dare you? You have no idea what this war has put me through. Me personally. Yelled Katara as her eyes started to water and she crouched down. The Fire Nation took my mother away from me. Katara places a hand on her necklace as tears roll down her cheek and drip off her chin. Zuko turns his head further and looks sadly at her. Katara begins sobbing, holding her head to her chest and burying her head in her knees. I'm sorry. That's something we have in common, said Zuko. Katara stopped crying for a moment and looked at Zuko, surprised about what he had just said. She fell silent and tried to look anywhere, but at the young exiled prince who she had just tried to verbally destroy. They silent stretched on like a shadow as time passed. I'm sorry I yelled at you before, said Katara looking down shamefully. It doesn't matter, said Zuko. It's just that for so long now, whenever I would imagine the face of the enemy, it was your face, said Katara. My face. I see, said Zuko turning away and places a hand to his scar. No, no, that's not what I meant. Stated Katara regretfully. It's okay. I used to think this scar marked me. The mark of the banished prince, cursed to chase the avatar forever. But lately, I've realized I'm free to determine my own destiny, even if I'll never be free of my mark. Said Zuko. Maybe you could be free of it, said Katara. The glimmer of hope flashes in the eyes of the exiled Fire Nation prince, as he turns back to the Water Tribe girl. What? asked Zuko. I have healing abilities Zuko, said Katara. Zuko sighed and looked away from her. It's a scar. It can't be healed, said Zuko. Katara reaches under her shirt and holds up a small white vial with a blue water tribe top. This is water from the spirit oasis at the North Pole. It has special properties, so I have be saving it for something important, said Katara walking close to Zuko who locked eyes with her. I don't know if it would work, but said Katara as she touched his face, his scar. Zuko gently took her hand away. Thank you. This is more kindness than I deserve, said Zuko. Katara smiled at him. No one is beyond kindness or redemption. It's what you have to, started Katara only for Zuko to kiss her. Katara's eyes widened before she closed her eyes and put her hands on Zuko's chest as he wrapped one of his arms around her, bringing her closer to him and the other on her face. Katara was surprised at how much she not only enjoyed the kiss, but responded to it in kind. She felt Zuko's tongue run along her bottom lip, asking for entrance to her own mouth. Katara opened her mouth and allowed him entrance. Zuko couldn't lie and say that he didn't feel something for Katara. Be it respect for her bending skills or respect for her beliefs never wavering in this crazy world. Whatever it was it didn't matter at this time. After a minute or so they broke away blushing. Both looked away from each other. The blush barley visible on Katara's more exotic dark skin. I'm sorry, said an embarrassed Zuko. Katara bit her lip. No, it's alright. I haven't kissed anyone like that in a while, said Katara starting to blush. Before Zuko could say anything else a hole was busted into the wall with Ong and Iroh stepping out. Zuko and Ong locked eyes for a few moments, but the only thing between them was a bitter dislike and even a little hate. Katara's eyes widened. Ong. Yelled Katara running up to Ong and giving him a hug. Ong, I knew you would come for me. Zuko. My boy are you alright? Asked Iroh giving his favorite nephew who he thought of as a son a massive hug. Uncle, I don't understand. What are you doing with the avatar? Asked Zuko regaining some of his old fire in his eyes and voice. Ong released Katara and glared at Zuko. Saving you? That's what. Growled Ong hotly. Zuko glared at Ong and tries to lunge at him, but Iroh grabs him, preventing him from causing a fight. Zuko, it's about time you and I have a heart-to-heart -heart talk, said Iroh, before turning to Ong and Katara. Go help your other friends. We'll catch up with you. Ong clasps his hands and bows respectfully to Iroh before running back through the hole in the cave. Katara slowly follows after him. She turns her head and takes one last sad glimpse at a sullen Zuko before exiting. Zuko looks at Katara. A bit of longing in his heart for the water tribe girl he had come to respect over the last few months. Why uncle? Asked Zuko looking anywhere but his uncle's face. Iroh squared his shoulders and looked at Zuko not as his nephew, but as the young man he had become. You are not the man you used to be, Zuko. You are stronger and wiser and freer than you have ever been. And now you have come to the crossroads of your destiny. It's time for you to choose. It's time for you to choose good. Said Iroh the strength of his lost youth in his voice. Zuko shuts his eyes, absorbing his uncle's words. Before he can process this wisdom and make it his own, Zuko is startled by a violent quake. A trail of crystals shoots out of the ground until they reach Iroh, encasing him in the thick glowing crystals. Zuko readies himself for an attack. Azula, Naruto, and two Dai Li agents lie down from the tunnel Zuko had entered through. Azula advances toward Zuko until his is directly between his uncle and his sister. Naruto looked at the two agents. Leave us, said Naruto with a commanding tone. The two agents bowed. 
Both Earth bend a stone cube under their feet and slide back up the ramp, leaving the four to themselves for the time being. I expected this kind of treachery from uncle, but Zuko, Prince Zuko you're a lot of things, but you're not a traitor, are you Zuzu? Said Azula appearing to really care for her brother. Release him immediately. Yelled Zuko glaring at Naruto as if he was the one who issued the order. Instead of allowing Azula to correct him, Naruto took a few steps forward until he was slightly behind Azula and off to her right. I can't do that Prince Zuko. Your uncle would meddle in things he has no business meddling in, said Naruto. Iro glared at Naruto. Like the fact that you were once trapped behind the doors of the Forbidden Tower. Stated Iro angrily. Naruto and Azula's eyes widened a bit as Zuko looked at him in shock. You knew what was behind the doors uncle. Asked Azula. Iro closed his eyes. Of course I knew. When I went to the Sprit World some ten years ago I saw him there. I contemplated releasing him, but the danger he would bring to the world would have been inconceivable, but you have ignored the warnings, and now you have brought forth death. A demon in man's form. A spirit that should not have been set free. Yelled Iro. Azula looked back to Zuko, but no longer underestimating her uncle. It's not too late for you Zuko. You can still redeem yourself brother, said Azula as before Zuko's eyes, she turned into the blue dragon from his dreams and back again. The kind of redemption she offers is not for you. Yelled Iro he to turning into the red dragon from his dreams, before changing back. Zuko lowed his head slightly. Uncle, Azula I don't know what to do, said Zuko. Why don't you let him decide, uncle I need you Zuko. I've plotted every move of this day. This glorious day in Fire Nation history. And the only way we win is together. At the end of this day, you will have your honor back. You will have your father's love. You will have everything you want, said Azula. Zuko, I am begging you, look into your heart and see what it is that you truly want. Yelled Iro. Azula began to walk down the tunnel that Ong and Katara took with Naruto following her. As Azula disappeared down the tunnel Naruto stopped and turned to Zuko. You are free to choose your own path. The turmoil you give yourself is because you are not clear about your own future, said Naruto turning and following Azula. But Ong and Katara. Katara and Ong found themselves in what could have once been the grand krautyard of the former palace, it had a large stream going, though the middle of it crystals everywhere, and a few statues. We've got to find Sokka and Toph. Yelled Katara in a hurried voice. A stream of blue fire rockets towards Ong and Katara from behind. Ong quickly turns around and earth bends a wall of stone to protect them. The fire hits the wall with great force, knocking Ong back. Azula held her hands out her fingers still smoking from the attack. Azula deal with the girl. I want the avatar myself. Yelled Naruto flying over Azula and bringing his leg down for a heel drop. Ong gasped and jumped out of the way as Naruto heel hit the ground, leaving a small crater. Ong glared at Naruto. Again. The last time we meet I kicked your butt. Yelled Ong as Naruto stood up and exited the crater. Naruto ripped off his robe leaving only his pants. Last time you fought to destroy the drill and I fought to stop you. This time if you and your little girlfriend want to leave you'll have to fight to the death. Yelled Naruto charging forward and throwing out a haymaker. Ong gasped and flipped to the side while also sending out a wind blast. Naruto ducked to the left and ran though some hand signs. Water style. Water drill bullet. Yelled Naruto launching a drilling bullet of water at Ong. Ong gulped as he would only have a few seconds to block it, at least he would have if Katara didn't disrupt the attack. We fight as a team or we die as a team Ong, said Katara. Azula came up on Katara with a flaming whip. Ong jumped up and unleashed a wind punch, sending Azula flying backwards. Naruto saw this and made a clone that appeared next to Azula stopping her decent. Azula sat her feet on the ground and wiped her bloody lip. Ong and Katara got back to back getting into their respective stances. Naruto and Azula looked at them, barely 15 feet from each other, with Katara and Ong trapped in the center. Naruto lifted his right hand as a ball of energy formed. Azula's left hand sparked as she began to gather lightning. Naruto throw the ball as Azula unleashed her lightning bolt. Ong sure did his foot making a thick wall of earth appear, while Katara brought up water and flash froze it. The two attacks were stopped, but both Ong and Katara were sent flying away from each other and towards Naruto and Azula. Naruto caught Katara by her neck and dragged her along the ground before slamming her into a wall, Magnig her head bounce off it like a child's ball. Katara groaned in pain, but remembering some of the lessons her brother taught her, she kicked off the wall while latching onto the arm that had her throat and twisted until both of them hit the ground with Naruto in an arm bar. Katara raised her hips and pulled down on Naruto's arm until she heard a snap. Naruto grunted in pain as Katara rolled away before encasing Naruto in ice. Don't move for that spot now, said Katara in a teasing voice, before turning to go and help on with Azula. Naruto groaned. How humiliating. Letting that little water tribe girl break my arm as she did, said Naruto as his arm started to heal. It would take several moments to do so. 
The tar runs around the smoldering wall and bends the water in the channel. She charges at Azula and brings the water crashing down on her. Azula deflects the attack with a short blast of fire. Katara keeps her momentum and spins the water around her, smashing it into the floor and creating a large wave. Azula stomps the ground and flings her hands out, making a wall of fire that evaporates the wave coming at her. The resulting steam hides Azula from view. Ong and Katara look left and right, preparing for a sneak attack. A moment later, Azula jumps out of the steam from one of the larger crystals high above. She attacks with two blue fireballs which Ong and Katara extinguish by bending the water from the channel into a shield. Azula lands on a piece of rock jutting out from one of the large columns. Ong shoots his fists forward and brings his palms down, sending a shock wave through the ground and into the column, destroying it. Azula gasps and drops down between Ong and Azula, pointing her fingers at both of them. Azula looks back and forth between the two of them nervously, waiting for their next move. Suddenly, a blast of red fire lands between Ong and Azula. They shield themselves from it and turn towards the new opponent, Zuko. He is wearing a simple brown shirt and brown pants, having shed his outer robes. Zuko draws closer to them, poised in his fire-bending stance. He looks to Azula, who gazes back at him harshly. Zuko then looks to Ong. The airbender gasps just before Zuko punches forward, shooting a fireball at him. Ong reacts just in time and protects himself by airbending a spiral of wind around his body. He jumps back to gain distance as the flame is dispersed. The camera pans to Azula. She smiles at Zuko's decision and attacks Katara, waving her arm in an arc and throwing a jet of fire at the waterbender with an underhand toss. Katara bends the water from her flask and extinguishes the fire. Zuko glared at Ong as he started furiously sending fireballs at Ong with a series of punches. Ong jumped back hoping none of them would hit, but was so focused on Zuko, he didn't have time to react to the kick that sent him skidding across the ground. Ong flipped backwards and upright before starting between the two men who wanted him dead. Ong barely had time to bring up two earth shields, as both men throw fireballs at him. Zuko broke off his attack as Katara attacked him with a large whip of water. Ong jumped out from between then shields only for Azula to fly in and hit Ong with a fire punch to his stomach, sending him flying. Zuko take care of the girl. Naruto and I shall handle the avatar. Yelled Azula only to block a fireball from her own uncle. Naruto and Azula turned to look at Iroh, who had taken a fighting stance. Naruto looked at Iroh with a hard gaze that only belonged to two men who had seen much in their short lives. I don't have time to deal with you. Azula I leave your uncle to you, said Naruto cutting his hand and running no hand signs. Summoning Jutsu. The puff of smoke appeared and quickly disappeared, revealing a young woman who appeared to be about Azula's age with long red hair, black dimension-shaped eyes, pale skin with blue scales over her eyes, and down the bridge of her nose, large cupped priests, wearing a battle kimono. She looked at Naruto. Yuan brother dear. Asked the woman. Naruto frowned at her. I don't have time for your games Rhea. Help Azula out, said Naruto charging on. Rhea turned to look at Azula. You must be the girl my brother has taken a liking to, said Rhea sniffing the air. I don't like the way you smell, especially with my brother's scent, said Rhea turning away from Azula and towards Iroh. With Ong and Naruto. Naruto appeared next to Ong and kicked him making him slide across the ground, making him cough up blood. Naruto glared at Ong. Naruto slowly walked up to the slowly recovering Ong. Ong tried to bend a pillar. Weak, said Naruto kicking Ong in his face. Ong twisted slightly before Naruto grabbed him by his collar and slammed him into the ground hard. Ong yelled out in pain. Ong flipped up and kicked Naruto in the face and gained some distance. Ong spit out blood from his mouth again Ash got into a fighting stance. Naruto folded his arms. Why do you fight for peace Ong? Asked Naruto. Ong narrowed his eyes. I fight to bring balance to the world. It was my fault that the world is the way it is. Naruto sighed. You're such a kid. The way to bring about peace is not the way to go. I was the chosen child of peace, but all around me there was death. I couldn't even save the woman I loved, said Naruto. Ong glared at Naruto. I'm sorry about that, but destroying the world won't bring her back, said Ong. Naruto chuckled. Destroy the world. Please. Only fools would try to destroy the world. I just want to live. Peace is not forever. No matter what you do or how hard you try someone will always suffer, said Naruto. Ong throws an air blast at Naruto. Naruto breaks though it and throws Ong into the dirt. Ong looks around and sees an army of Dai Li agents surrounding Katara Iroh on the ground panting. There are too many of them, said Ong as the guru's words came back to him. The only way is to let her go. Ong turns away from Azula and Zuko, and Earth bends a crystal shelter tent. Ong starts meditating. Inside Ong's mind, a giant version of himself in the avatar state, the avatar spirit, holds an air-bending sphere with a normal-sized version of himself in the avatar state. Back in the crystal shelter, Ong enters the avatar state, and the crystal shelter starts glowing, alerting those outside. 
Inside the shelter, Ong opens his glowing eyes and starts levitating above the crowd. The camera shows Katara looking up to Ong with hope. But before Ong can let Katara go and control the avatar state, a bolt of lightning strikes him in the back. Cut to Azula in lightning summoning position with her fingers smoking. The avatar spirit lets go of Ong and falls out of the plane of existence. Katara's eye widen in shock. She moves around in a hard pattern and making large wave knocking everyone away as she rode a wave and caught Ong. Naruto looked at this all with a sort of guilt in his heart. Ong was already dead. No need for him to worry. Fiznish the girl. There is no room for loose ends, said Naruto. The Dai Li move in on them, but stop as a wall of fire appears in front of Katara and Ong, with Iroh glaring at the Dai Li. Go. Oh, you have to get out of here. I'll hold them off as long as I can. Yell Iroh taking down five agents at once. Katara nods and using a wave to take her and Ong out of the underground. Bang a few minutes later. The gong sat on top of Appa as Katara held Ong. Katara I don't feel a heartbeat. Said Toph worried about her friend. Katara removed the veil of spirit water and placed it on Ong's burned back. It glowed a spirit blue before Ong breathed. Katara hugged Ong tears clear in her eyes. Throne room of Ba Sing Si. The Dai Li all bowed before Azula, Zuko and Naruto. We did it Princess Azula. The city that stood as the sole opponent the Fire Nation could not defeat for a hundred years has fallen, said Naruto. Azula smiled at her lover. That's right. And it's thanks to my brother, said Azula. I betrayed uncle, said Zuko sadly and unsure if he made the right choice. Azula stood from the throne and placed her hand on her older brother's shoulder. No Zuko. He betrayed you, me, our family, and our nation. We we return home father will welcome you as a war hero, said Azula. But I don't have the avatar. What if he doesn't restore my honor? Asked Zuko. Naruto placed his hand on Zuko's shoulder. A man must restore his own honor Prince Zuko. And today you did just that said Naruto. Above them sitting just out of sight Rhea looked at them with a smirk. Things will soon become fun, said Rhea. Naruto gave a small smirk to his three lovers, as they were all passed out in bliss of the pleasure they just received from him. All three girls had their hair out of their usual styles, and the covers were thrown all over the place. Naruto got up and quickly donned his pants as well as a long red jacket, before walking out of the room and walking onto deck. Ignoring everything else but what he saw. Zuko was stating by the railing. Naruto slowly walked up to him and slapped him on the back. Zuko nearly went off the ship but managed to regain his balance. How's it hanging Zuko? Asked Naruto trying to be friendly to his master's brother. It's been nearly three years since I was banished from my country my home. All that time I spent out in the world hunting the avatar, and when I finally do get the chance to capture him, I betrayed my uncle. After so long I'm not sure if I'm ready to return ready to face my father, said Zuko. Naruto sighed. You're a damn fool Zuko, said Naruto as he turned to leave. Whatever happened during your time away made you stronger for it. You are a man without your father's approval. Your father is a man your uncle is a man. The things that happened, our choices rest squarely on our shoulders. No matter what you are told or what is said remember that your destiny, your honor, your actions and their consequences are yours and yours alone, said Naruto. Funny. That's something uncle would have said, said Zuko quietly. Naruto returned to the room to see Tai Li was up. Naruto couldn't stop the grin on his face if he tired. Fire Nation. The people of the Fire Nation gathered at the foot of the palace to await the address by the royal advisors to the princess. Rumors had been flying over the last few weeks about what many had heard as the fall of Ba Sing Si. Many believed them to be false. Ba Sing Si had never fallen. Not in the last thousand years since the walls were erected. Be silent. Yelled two elderly women walking into the area and addressing the crowd. Their princess Azula, clever and beautiful, disguised herself as the enemy and entered the Earth Kingdom's capital. In the heart of Ba Sing Si she found her brother. The fierce and determined banished Prince Zuko and together they faced the avatar. Started Lee. And he fell. And the Earth Kingdom fell. Yelled Lo and Lee. Azula's agents, led by the new Grand General and personal bodyguard to the princess. Naruto quickly overtook the city. They went to Ba Sing Si's great walls, started Lo. And brought them down. Yelled Lo and Lee. The armies of the Fire Nation surged through the walls and swarmed over Ba Sing Si, securing the Fire Nation's greatest victory. Yelled Lee. Flashback. Naruto stood on top of the walls with the Dai Li around him. The twelve he had selected along with the leader of them. Lord Naruto we are ready, said Sasuke. Do it, said Naruto turning and walking away as the Dai Li brought down the walls, allowing the armies of the Fire Nation to enter the city and quickly assume control. Flashback end. Now the heroes have returned home. Yelled Lo and Lee. Their princess Azula. Yelled Lo talking for the first time alone. And after three long, hard years. Your prince has returned, said Lee. Zuko. They yelled together. 
Azula and Zuko arrived out of the palace at the same time. Azula raveling in the cheers, while Zuko seemed conflicted. No one saw this, except Naruto. Captured Fire Nation ship. Sokka walked the deck as he looked out over the seas. The water was warm, nothing like the cold seas he was accustomed to. He drew parallels between the rest of the world and his home. Sokka knew that as a warrior he should never get homesick, but the truth is that he was homesick almost as much as Katara was. Sokka what are you doing outside? Asked Katara walking up onto the deck. Sokka smiled at Katara. He sometimes forgot that his sister was able to read him like she did. Katara's left her hair down after the scrap with the royal siblings. She also took the sleeves off of her clothes. She had also helped him manage his now slightly long hair. Over the last few weeks his simple wolf's tail grew long, almost past his shoulder blades, so Katara took the ends and rolled them into about 30 braids. Sokka closed his eyes and took in a breath. He quickly reopened them to look at Katara. Home. I was thinking about the kids and Grand back home Katara. Are they safe? Are they warm enough? Is there enough food to go around, said Sokka. Katara sighed. We can't worry about that now Sokka. We have other matters to worry about, said Katara. Sokka. Nodded. What about Ong? Asked Sokka. Katara's eyes narrowed. Dad is watching him for us right now, said Katara. A bit of bite to her voice. Sokka sighed. Ever since reuniting with their father almost two weeks ago, Katara had done nothing but be cold and distant from him. Sokka could understand somewhat. The day they reunited Sokka had actually decked him. Katara I know what you're thinking, but you have to forgive him eventually, said Sokka. Katara glared at the water before turning to leave. I don't have to do a thing Sokka, said Katara. In the Fire Nation Palace. Naruto walked the palace grounds wearing basic training gear. He really didn't have much to do at the moment. Sure he could have Meyer Tai Lee in his bed currently, but he wasn't really in the mood for that right now. Azula and Zuko were both in a meeting with the Fire Lord, the Dai Li were guarding Azula and a few other things on Naruto's orders, and walking around the city seemed pointless. Naruto stopped walking for a moment and looked around the area. The grounds were never empty no matter the time of day. Whether it was soldiers or the palace caretakers walking around, someone was always around. Narrowing his eyes he turned around and glared at the figure that stood before him. The figure was wrapped in a black cloak and stood at about 6'5 with long black hair pulled into a ponytail with long bangs. Who are you? Asked Naruto. The man didn't say anything and instead charged at Naruto before making two small flame daggers. Naruto groaned in annoyance. The man swiped at Naruto with a dagger. Naruto took a step back and the man moved in with an intense strike. Naruto grabbed the man's arm and twisted him around before taking him to the ground hard. Before the man could recover Naruto snapped his neck. An assassin. Either not very skilled in the art or rookie if his display was anything to go off of, said Naruto aloud. As he heard the sounds of heavy armored feet met his ear. Lord Naruto. Yelled the head of the guards. Are you alright sir? Yes. I'm actually wondering why this area of the castle is currently closed. Asked Naruto. The head guard frowned. I was told only this morning that this area would be closed for maintenance my lord. This came down from the fire lord himself, said the guard. Naruto nodded. Thank you, said Naruto turning to leave. You have confirmed something I was wondering, said Naruto. Later that day sundown. Azula was relaxing in one of the many natural hot springs that were scattered thought out the palace grounds with a handmaid in her two subbing her feet. Azula had to sit on the left of her father, while Zuko had sat on the right during a war council, after Ozai talked to both siblings one on one and then together. Azula let out a sigh of relief as her muscles relaxed. Azula felt a presence behind her. Only one person was brave strong enough to sneak up on her. What do you need Naruto? Can't you see I'm relaxing, said Azula as if she was talking to a mere servant that had annoyed her. We need to talk Azula, said Naruto his voice icy. Azula picked up on the tone in an instant. Leave me and the general to speak in private, said Azula. The maidens quickly gathered their bushes and left the area. Once they were alone Naruto's eyes glowed before a small bubble surrounded them. The reason Naruto did this was simple. Information. Jiraiya wasn't the hapless pervert he always acted. The man reason he entered into peeping was because tongues seemed to loosen in the hot springs, bars, and brothels. The four may not seem like much, but a few of them had information that could spark revolutions. Naruto would never be so careless as to allow information to slip to the enemies. We're alone. Speck, said Azula. I was attacked by an assassin in the western part of the palace. Were you aware that that area was closed for matinee? Asked Naruto. Azula rubbed her chin. That makes no sense. The western part of the palace was repaired last winter after some structural damage for a snowstorm, said Azula. I knew it, said Naruto. I was targeted by your father. He's out to get me. Azula looked at Naruto with a glare that would have set him on fire. 
My father would never get rid of such a powerful asset, said Azula. Naruto narrowed his own eyes. Do not presume to know that Azula. Your father is a man obsessed with his legacy. He burned your brother for giving a valid point during a war council. During my own war councils I had two or three people speak out against me for the simple fact that I would have abandoned entire cities just to get the advantage over an enemy. I banished them from my council for a time. Only a meeting or two, but never outright harmed them, said Naruto. It is possible that your father also fears losing his throne to me or maybe even you, said Naruto. Azula stood out of the water and quickly donned her bathing robe. If what you say is true then father has overstepped his position, said Azula in a rare show of anger at her father for trying to kill her servant. Naruto walked up to Azula and gently touched her cheek. Do not be reckless Azula. Do not be hesitant either, said Naruto as he vanished into nothing. With Oz I. Oz I sat on his throne eyes narrowed and only the flames the flames behind him as he didn't feel like keeping the towering infernos up currently. Contrary to what many people believed Oz I wasn't as strong as people preserved him to be. He was more cunning than his brother was and a lot more deadly since he would kill if need be. All firebenders of the upper level could use lightning despite the fact that only the royal firebenders were allowed to do outside only in defense of the crown. Oz I walked the path to hell with all the bravado, but none of the godly power. That honor went to his daughter Azula, who wielded the legendary blue flames. Stories were often told about the flames of colors. During the great times there were firebenders that controlled colored flames. The strongest of which was said to belong to the gods of hell. The black flames. Iroh had claimed to have seen such flames on his trip to the spirit world. That was one of the reasons he trained Azula to be his sword and not a shield. Shields became dented over time and useless. A sword was so much more useful. Even when broken a sword could kill. So even on the day Azula was broken she would have her uses. Siring a progeny was the only option he had if she sired a child and turned against him. He would even have her name the child after him should be be a boy. Oz I was brought out of his musing as a royal messenger walked in. What is it? Asked Oz I. The messenger bowed. My lord I was told to deliver a simple message from Lord Naruto, said the messenger. Oz I's blood ran cold and his hairs stood on end. What is the message? He said sorry Oz I better luck next time, said the messenger. The flames around the room sparked to live almost reaching the ceiling. I have my own message, said Oz I as sparks found the tips of his fingers as he fired a bolt of lightning at the messenger. The messenger screamed in pain. Blood boiled in his body as it leaked from his nose, mouth and eyes. After only a minute Oz I increased the power taking the poor man off his feet and sending him across the room. Once he was nothing but corpse of smoked meat Oz I stopped. He called for the guards to remove the smoldering and sticking corpse. Oz I was now worried even if his face didn't show it. With Naruto. Naruto sat inside of the prison with Iroh sitting across from him acting as if he had lost his mind. Naruto was sitting on a chair. You can quit pretending Iroh. I can see it from here, said Naruto in annoyance. Iroh's eyes gained a sharp look as he became more refined. I see, said Iroh. If you know I'm only acting then why are you here? Naruto narrowed his eyes. Information on Ozai's assassins, said Naruto. What do you mean his assassins? Ozai. Last I heard they were all killed during an attempt on the Earth King some years ago, said Iroh. Naruto closed his eyes. Well they're back. If not in greater number. I've been the victim of two attempts. The last one I'm sure was just a probing attempt, said Naruto. Iroh raised a brow. That sounds like one of the non-bender assassins, said Iroh. Naruto smiled. Thanks that all I needed to know, said Naruto getting up and turning to leave. Hold it. Yelled Iroh making Naruto stop in his tracks. I answered your questions now I need you to tell me something. Why are you bringing war to these lands? Why not fight to save them? Asked Iroh. Naruto smiled. The same reason I turned my back on the teaching of the toads. Love will make a man dive right though the fires of hell and even attempt to kill a god for the person he loves, said Naruto. You're doing all this for love, said Iroh shocked. Naruto took a coin out of his pocket and tossed it to Iroh. Iroh caught it and examined the coin. It was ancient. Almost older than the era. A priceless artifact. Love and hate are two sides of the same thing. I hate the current world as much as I love Azula, said Naruto as he continued to walk leaving a stunned Iroh behind. In Azula's room an hour later. So what is our next move Azula? Asked Tai Lee laying under the covers with her head in Azula's cleavage. Mai sat on a chair and Naruto by the door with his eyes closed. I need to know the plans of the Avatars group and those of Zuko, said Azula blowing blue flames into the air. Easier said than done, said Mai. We don't know if the Avatar is alive or not, said Mai. Naruto smirked at this. He's alive alright, said Naruto making the women look at him. How do you know if he's alive or not? Asked Azula eyes narrowed. Naruto put his hands in his pocket. 
because that kid is too stubborn to die, as well as the fact that he wants to bring about peace. He'll fight, he'll struggle, he'll taste death time and time again, said Naruto turning to leave. Only when he knows he reaches his full pot it'll will I kill him. Amp of the gong. Sokka fell slightly on top of Tafho was chuckling lightly before kissing Sokka on the lips. Top got up and slipped on her clothes. We have to do this again snuzzles. Although next time I want you to fence inside me, said Toph leaving to her own tent. Both were unaware of the eyes that watched them. But Zuko and Naruto. Zuko stood opposite Naruto in the training grounds before throwing addicts at the general. Naruto side-stepped each attack before appearing before him and punching him in the stomach. Zuko went flying before landing and rolling on the ground. Zuko got up and made two flaming whips appear before attacking him with the whips. Naruto jumped over the whips and put his boots in Zuko's chest. Zuko hit the ground hard and had hacking coughs. That's enough Zuko, said Naruto. Your firebending is impressive, but it's not your forte. You might want to stick with your swords. So what you're going to put me down for not being a prodigy like Azula? Asked Zuko enraged. Naruto grabbed his robe and threw it over his combat clothes. That would make me the biggest hypocrite in the world. Before I was Hokage I was the dead last, the weakest I trained, I fought, I bleed, I cried, I clawed my way to power, said Naruto. Zuko nodded at this, contemplating Naruto's words. But Suki. Suki was in the middle of her sit-ups as sweat poured down her body. She had been moved to the Boiling Rock prison several weeks ago and had nothing to do. The warden was a strict man, but he had a code. Any guard found abusing their power, i.e. raping a prisoner, was dealt with permanently. She was about to start her next set when she hard two guards outside of her cell. Hey did you hear about the avatar? Asked the guard. A female from the sounds of it. Yeah, said a male voice. His whole damn team bought the farm. The woman chuckled. Too bad that happened. I heard that the two water tribe kids are gone. From what I understand those wets are exotic and rare in the slave markets, said the woman. Let's get back to our rounds. That old bastard Wong won't be happy if we leave to go and fuck. Too bad. I was looking forward to having fun with that one broad, said the male. Suki stood up and started to cry. Sokka, said Suki. But the gong. Gong sat cross-legged with his eyes closed, trying to gain access to the cosmos, but it just wasn't happening. Katara was minding the soup. The only people missing were Toph and Sokka who left nearly 30 minutes ago to gather firewood. Katara had a feeling hat they were doing more than gathering wood. She had been awake two nights ago when Toph had for lack of better term raped Sokka and then Sokka, taking his time to get himself off. Katara knew most of Sokka's sexual exploits as he knew of hers. Sure she didn't have the chance to have sex while in the South Pole, since most of the boys had left to fight, but Jet, Haru, and even two or three random flings. Hey Katara we're back, said Sokka. Katara was brought out of her mind as she looked to see her brother and the younger girl. They had a fair amount of firewood. Katara smiled at her brother before nodding and taking the wood and adding it to the fire. Sokka looked at Ong. Is he still at it? Asked a worried Sokka. Yes and nothing is working, said Ong opening his eyes and looking at Sokka. My seventh chakra is blocked. I can't go into the avatar state. Big whoop. You're still a master of earth, water, and fire bending. Just use that and kick the royal flaming chicken off his throat. Ong looked down. It's not that simple Toph, said Ong. Toph glared at Ong. It's as easy as shoving your beep in a willing beep. Just do it, said Toph. At her last words everyone blushed. Sokka thinking of the things that did not too long ago, Katara thinking of her some of her past conquests, and Ong thinking about what Katara would do with her body. Would everyone forget they were teenagers with sex on the brain? Toph. I want a word please. Asked Katara. Toph shrugged her shoulders. Whatever you say sugar queen, said Toph. Toph followed Katara several feet away from the boys into a small clearing and see their Katara turned to Toph with a glare. Whatever it is that you and Sokka are doing I want it to end right now, said Katara. Toph raised an eyebrow. Why? It's not like you're his wife or anything like that. Sokka is a grown man and I'm a woman. What we get up to in our own time is our business, said Toph. Katara would be red with anger if she could. You're 14. Sokka is 18. He's four years your senior. Yelled Katara. Toph looked at her fingers, as if she could, look sugar queen, the fact of the matter is that this is expected of me. By the time most society girls are 16, they've already had several lovers, even if they are married. My mother married my father at 13. On the night of their wedding both of them took a slave into a separate room and had fun, before they did each other. Fact is whatever I do I'm within my rights, said Toph. Katara folded her arms. I'm serious Toph. This is your only warning, said Katara. And if I don't comply? Asked Toph, before a cut appeared on her face. Toph reached up and touched her face as blood dripped down. Then you and me are going to fight, said Katara walking away. Toph smirked. 
to bad sugar queen. I do what I want and to hell with what you want, said Toph. End chapter. So this part ends here. If you want to see next part of this series. Like the video now and share the story with your friends. Bye bye.